pseudo class. Things are going to get very interesting from now on as we go on with pseudo classes and further discuss its types. Before we get to its definition, let's first understand why you need pseudo class. So if you look at these anchor tags, one is a normal anchor tag and another is having CSS pseudo class applied. Now when the mouse is rolled over the normal anchor tag, there is nothing happening to it. But when I roll over to this anchor tag, which is having pseudo class, can you see the difference? You probably notice the shadow effect and also you can see there is some color. All these are special states of the element. So when you want to deal with special states of an element, you have to use pseudo classes. You can also see the code where in the first case just the class is given whereas in the second case you can also see colon and hover which is actually a pseudo class. This also means every time you give pseudo class you will have a colon to separate the selector from the state. So you have the selector colon the state the special state like hover or maybe focus. So this is what pseudo class is all about. There are various pseudo classes available and we will be covering mostly the important ones as we move on. Linguistic pseudo classes will help you select the elements based on their language or script direction. So when you want the elements to be in a specific direction or in a specific language, then this pseudo class is considered. Let's take a look at the example. If I give a div and inside this div, I give the dir that is the direction attribute, which has basically three values that is RTL, LTR and auto. The RTL is used for targeting right to left elements or text. The LTR is used for targeting left to right elements or text. And the auto actually follows the default. So I will say RTL here in the direction, giving a span here in which I'll say this is right hand side. Similarly, I'll give another div with the LTR value, giving span. This is a left hand side. Now the linguistic pseudo class provides us two pseudo classes to deal with. They are the colon DIR that is the direction pseudo class and the language LANG lang pseudo class. The direction pseudo class which we will see right now helps you select the elements based on their direction. So in the style if I give colon DIR and in the brackets, if I say RTL, that is right to left, it will select the right hand side span element. The direction pseudo class requires one parameter which represents the text direction. So giving the parameter here is mandatory. You cannot leave it blank. I'll open the brackets and will define font size and color. Now if I check the browser, you can see there is no output displayed. Well, because clearly Chrome does not support this, but when I switch to Firefox, you can see the output. So while working with pseudo classes, check their compatibility with different browsers first. Also by default, the text direction will be left to right if not specified. Okay, so moving on, let's check the lang pseudo class. The language pseudo class is used to select the elements based on their language which they are determined. So let me give lang attribute here and I'll give the value fr which stands for French. And to the second division, I will give lang as en which is English. I also want to quote a point here that as a developer, you must know few ISO language codes like fr, en, it, zh or ru. You never know they might come in handy in certain situations. Also, we will be practicing few in forthcoming sections. So you will have clear idea of the real world scenario as well. 
all right if i want to style this element on the basis of the language i'll give styling here saying language fr and language en here also giving parameter is mandatory so you can see in the browser how we have selected the element on the basis of their language note that the value which you give in lang attribute will always be in two letter language code or combination of two letter codes now let's talk about relative questions so the first question is from this code how will you select all the paragraphs which are on the right hand side very simple to select all the paragraphs which are at the right hand side you will write the css code first of all paragraphs i'll say p then putting a colon i'll say dir the direction in the brackets i'm going to say rtl this will actually select all the paragraphs having direction is equal to rtl then you open the curly brackets and you can write the style you want the second question is explain which elements will this css code be applied to so in this code the div greater than p will select the paragraph which is direct child of the div tag right because the greater than sign is for child selector then the colon direction ltr will select the paragraph which is assigned left direction in the document so the div greater than p colon dir and ltr in the bracket will select this paragraph which is the fifth paragraph generally location pseudo classes are used when there are hyperlinks involved in the document let's check few practical examples so you can understand it more clearly the first location pseudo class we will see is colon any link this pseudo class selector will select the hyperlinks regardless of whether they are visited or not and it will match all the anchor tags which have href attribute in them so when i say visited or not it means let me open the browser first of all and let me search learn css here you can see various links here which have the color blue as default when the browser loads so this shows that the links are not visited yet when i select one link and let me revisit the search page you can see the color of the link which is visited has now changed so the link is now in the visited state all right so let's take a look at an example now i will say div and inside i will give two or maybe three anchor tags these two will contain the href attribute and last one is just the placeholder but still an anchor tag now to add styles to them i will simply use the element selector here i will say a and will define color attribute in the browser you can see all the anchor tags are styled now if i use the any link pseudo class here you can see the last anchor tag is ignored because the any link will select only those links which have the href attribute or in other words it's a proper link now let's see link and visited pseudo classes these two are also part of location pseudo classes so let me add few more links here which are the login page home page about us and contact us page respectively now if i want to highlight those links which are not visited by the user for that i will use the link pseudo class so link will select all the anchor tags which are not yet visited here in the css let me remove the styling which we saw earlier and i will give anchor that is a colon link now i will open the brackets and let me define a color to it similarly i will use the visited pseudo class as well i'll say a colon visited the visited pseudo class is used to select those links which are already visited by the user so let me go ahead and give the color here as well i'll simply say the gray color 
now let's check the browser you can see all the links are displayed in link styled color as they are not visited now when i start to click them one by one you can see their color changes as they fall into the visited category so this is what the link and visited pseudo classes are used for now let's move to the target pseudo class so as the name says this pseudo class is used to target the unique element which has the matching id as the url so here in the code i'll define a section and inside i will write four paragraphs each having unique ids now in the division where we have given links i will add four new links i'll give the link references same as the id name of the below given paragraphs also let me give heading to this division and section all right now for the css i will give here p colon target p because we want to target the paragraphs when the links are selected i will give few rules here color the background color the border and the radius now in the browser you can see the links are displayed let me select the link and you can see the paragraph is highlighted so that is a relation established between the paragraph and the link similarly if i select this link you can see it highlights the respective paragraph as we have passed the paragraph id name inside the href it will target the paragraphs when we click the link if you want to target the particular text inside these paragraphs you can do that as well let's say i want this text to be targeted in all these paragraphs so for that i will give span here you can also give maybe italic that is i or bold b if you want text to appear in a different format anyways now in the css i will write p colon target and span so you can also add elements like this when you want certain elements to be targeted as well i will give few rules here let's say color font size and the style now if you look at the browser when i select the link you can see it highlights the paragraph as well as the text which is part of the span so this is how you work with location pseudo classes again to summarize we learned the any link link visited and target pseudo classes which fall under the location pseudo class now let's talk about questions and assignments so the first assignment i am giving is create the menu and on click of the link display the respective details using the target pseudo class so in the body first we will define a heading i'll say h1 giving the heading here now i'll create a division and inside i will give two anchor tags link names will be html and css reference we will give in a moment let me give class to this div i'll say select dash menu now i will create another division and inside i will give the paragraph i want this text to be highlighted differently so i will give span here also let me give id name as html to this division similarly for the css link i'll copy this div and paste it here and i'll change id to css and let me change the paragraph content all right so let's give the reference now i'll say hash html and hash css so our page looks like this now let's add some styling to it starting with the body tag let me set black background to it now h1 i will add color and alignment to it then we'll select the div which has paragraphs in it so i will say dot select dash menu space div giving properties color display border radius and padding next we'll select the links so i'll say dot select dash menu space a that is anchor you can also write just a there is nothing wrong with that 
It's just that I am being more specific, which is a good practice in a way. Okay, so firstly, I'll give text decoration none. This property will remove the underline from the links, which by default gets generated on any link defined inside the HTML document. Then I will give few more properties. Finally, we'll use the target pseudo class on this div. So I'll say dot select dash menu div colon target. And inside I'll define few properties like display margin padding font style size and color i also want to highlight the span so i will say span here and will give color to it now let's check the browser let me click on the html link selecting the css link now and there we have the output the second question is how will you apply css to visited links well, we use the colon visited that is the visited pseudo class with an anchor tag and apply the CSS rules. So once a link is visited, whatever you have configured with the visited pseudo class that will be applied. The third question is how can you remove the underline from anchor tag links? Well, it's very simple. You just have to use the text decoration colon none that is you assign none to text decoration and that will remove the underlines of anchor tag. User action pseudo classes are by far the most important and widely used pseudo classes. As this pseudo class requires some interaction, some activity performed by the user on the elements in order for them to be applied, such as the hover effect or the focus effect. So these effects will only trigger when the user rolls over the mouse on the element or maybe it receives the cursor or a focus. That's why it is known as user action pseudo classes. First pseudo class in this category is the hover pseudo class. So let's see it practically in the body. I will simply define a button in the browser. You can see the button. Now let's give CSS. I'll say here button and open the brackets. I'll define how the button should look. I'll give width, margin, padding, color and font weight, background color, border and its radius. Let me give text transform property. You can see various values it holds. So by using this property, you can specify how your text should look whether it should be in uppercase or lowercase. I will set it to uppercase. If you take a look at the browser, you can see how the button looks. Now it's time to apply the hover effect. I'll say button colon hover. Now whatever property I define inside this hover will be triggered when I roll the mouse that is hover the mouse over the button. This is what the hover pseudo class does when the user interacts with an element with a mouse pointer, the hover effect gets triggered. I'll give shadow property here. I'll say box shadow. It takes up to five values, including color. Right now I'm giving zero to the first four values so that you can understand what each value will do when I give random values instead of zero. The first four values are used to represent the horizontal shadow that is offset X, vertical shadow that is offset Y, blur radius and the spread radius and the fifth value as color. So if I give 10 pixels to the offset X, you can see what hover effect it gives. Now if I give 10 pixels to offset Y, you can see the shadow is applied downwards. Similarly, if I give 10 pixels to blur radius, you can see the different effect applied. Giving 10 pixels to spread radius now, and you can see the area the shadow covers. Now let me go ahead and define values the way I want. So the hover effect you can see on the browser right now. Let's make it more defined. I'll add 
inset here now the inset is used to give the shadow inside the button as well let me give four values again to create a glowing effect i'll also add a border here now let's check the output and when i roll over the mouse you can see the hover effect this gives you the idea about what the hover effect is and the colon hover that is pseudo class will help you to handle these kind of situations in practical world let's talk about an assignment or a question the assignment is create a link and apply hover effects as you can see in the output let's do it together i'll start by defining a division inside the body now we want a link so i will give an anchor tag inside this division now let's give css starting with the body tag let me set black background to it now align the division to center i'll give text align and margin property to this div i'll give styling to the anchor tag and box shadow first color border radius font size and family and let me also give text decoration and that will be none now let's apply the hover effect i'll give color and again the box shadow now when i roll the pointer over to the link you can see the hover effect if you wish to add some transition to it you can do that by giving the transition rule to anchor though we will be learning transition at a later stage as well but quickly it's easy to understand let me give transition here and just the timing i'll say 0.8 seconds now when i take the mouse pointer to the link you can see the transition over effect now we will be seeing the active pseudo class which also falls in the user action pseudo class category so when an element is applied with the active pseudo class that element will get activated when the user clicks or presses down the mouse button on it i will continue the code which we saw in the previous lecture so here if i just remove the hover and add active now when i roll over the mouse on the button you can see the glow effect is gone but when i press the button you can see the effect is being displayed and at the same time when i release the button then the effect is gone not only that active pseudo class also gets triggered when you press the button with the help of space bar let me move to the button by pressing tab now when i press space bar you can see the active pseudo class is getting triggered but the same thing won't work on the anchor tags that is links let me change to anchor tag instead of a button and i'll also change that in the css as well now when i press the tab and space you can see the active pseudo class is no longer getting selected but when i click on the link you can see the class getting triggered so this is how the active pseudo class works in order to view the effect of the active pseudo class the element needs to be selected like button pressed maybe the space bar on the button or when it is a link or similar element the mouse button needs to be pressed let's talk about the question so where do you think the active pseudo class is useful when you want to apply the css on elements which are active that is the action is being performed on it when the mouse button is pressed on them or when the enter or space bar like keys are pressed in such cases you see that the active pseudo class will be a great help the second question is how is the active pseudo class is different from the hover pseudo class well active means some action is getting or being performed on the element whereas hover is just about the roll over you just move the mouse over the element that's what hover is and active where some action is being taken on it like button is pressed maybe space bar or enter key is pressed for that element
the focus pseudo class is very similar to the active pseudo class the only difference is that in focus pseudo class the element has to be selected once to activate the focused state while in active pseudo class the element maintains the active state till the user maintains the clicked or pressed state let's understand it by seeing an example i'll be using the same code which we saw in the previous lecture here instead of active i'll say focus now when i click on the button you see the focus being triggered and when i click anywhere on the screen you can see the focus state is no longer triggered let's see one more example which shows the difference between active and focus pseudo classes i'll add another button and we'll give class names to both of them now in the css i'll give focus to this button and active to the other button now let's check the output as we have seen in the previous lecture i'll press tab to put the active cursor on the element you can see the first button is getting highlighted as it has the focus pseudo class applied and when i press tab again you can see there is no effect displayed because this button has active class applied so i'll press space and hold it you see the button is getting highlighted now when i release the space bar the effect is gone which means the active class is no longer applied not only on buttons but on links as well if i change these buttons to anchor tags and now if i press tab you can see the first link is getting focused as it has the focus class but now if i press tab again there is no effect displayed on the second link despite pressing the space bar but when i click on the link you can see the active class being triggered so in focus pseudo class when the user clicks or selects the element the focus gets triggered until the user selects another element now i'm going to give you an assignment create a form and add the focus effect on the fields on getting selected i hope you have tried it let's also see the solution together okay so i have boilerplate code defined here already now inside body i'll give heading first and then we'll give the form tag we'll just add the name and email input tabs so for that first i will give an unordered list and in the li i'll give a label for name and an input with type text and a placeholder message similarly for the email i'll give a label inside the li and an input with type email and again a placeholder message let me also give a button i'll say input with type submit now i will give some css style to the form starting with the body tag let me set black background to it now heading i'll give the alignment to text and let's define font size and color let's also apply some style to the label i'll give color size and display as inline block next i want to apply some style on the form i'll give margin equals 0 and auto margin property takes up to four values that is top and bottom margin left and right margin here i have given two values the first value will be applied to top and bottom margin and the second value will be applied to left and right margin okay also giving the width padding border and border radius now if i look at the form all the fields are quite joined so let me add some space between them i'll give form li plus li using the adjacent selector here to select the adjacent list that is the li of first li and inside i'll give margin top as i want to add space from the top 
also i don't want the bullets as we have used the allies here the bullets are by default getting displayed so i'll remove them i'll say ul and inside i'll give list style equals none let me increase the font size of the input and finally adding the focus pseudo class to the input i'll give background color and let's save this and check the browser now when i select any field you can see the focus effect is getting triggered so this is a kind of practical use of focus pseudo class we often see in the real world scenario moving on to the next pseudo class is the user action category and that is the focus within pseudo class the focus within pseudo class is similar to the focus pseudo class but the only difference is that the focus within pseudo class is used for focusing the descendants or child elements of the parent element let's take a look at an example i will create a form i'll define a form tag and will give a class name here let me give h1 i will give a div with class name my div and inside i'll give a label with an input having type text and a placeholder message similarly i will create another div with the same class name so let me copy this division and paste it here i'll change the label and input type to email let's also give few radio buttons i'll create a div with the same class name which we are using that is my div i'll give label here naming it occupation giving three radio buttons named as business job and self employed finally i am giving a submit button so i'll say input with type submit all right so we are ready with the form let's add css styles now first i'll change the appearance of the document by giving background color font family and color inside body I want to align the form so I'll give text align to form Similarly I'll also give some properties to division I'll give margin padding border and the border radius Let me also give the focus within pseudo class to the division I'll say dot my div colon focus dash within and let's give some background color and border now let me just explain the scenario which i have created i have this form tag and inside there are various elements correct so the form tag becomes the parent element and elements inside are the child of the form the focus within pseudo class which we have given to the division will be triggered whenever any of the child elements gets selected that is any of the divs so in the browser when i select any field you can see the focus within class getting activated and the effect is displayed when i click outside the form you can see the effect is gone but again when i select any field this time i will press tab to select the field and you can see the focus within pseudo class gets triggered so you won't be able to target individual elements unless that element is nested with few more elements which become children for that element this is how you use the focus within pseudo class now let's talk about relative questions explain a practical scenario where you can make use of focus within okay so let's create an example where i want to display the prompt message whenever the field gets selected for that i'll first give a div with the class name as container inside i want a password field so i'll give an input with type password and a placeholder message as well now i will give another div with class prompt message and here i will simply pass the message in the browser you can see the message getting displayed now what i want to do is by using the focus within pseudo class i want to display this message when the field is selected so in the css i'll first hide the message i'm going to say 
the class name that is prompt dash message I'll set display to none this will hide the message as you can see in the browser now I'm going to use the focus within class on the parent div so let me say container colon focus dash within and also I want to display the message so giving the class name prompt dash message here as well let me give a few styling I'll say display and color so in the browser you can see when I select the field the message is getting displayed the second question is how is the focus different from the focus within well when using the focus pseudo class you have to keep in mind that you will be targeting individual elements or the elements which share the same class names focus will not allow you to select all the children of some parent element but when it comes to the focus within pseudo class you have a privilege to select the child that is the descendants elements within the parent element for example the code which we saw just now if I add focus to the form you can see on the browser nothing happens because you cannot target all the elements with this class but instead if I write input now you can see the focus effect when I select any field because now I am instructing the browser to focus on specific fields all right so now we will be moving to the input pseudo classes all these pseudo classes are categorized as input pseudo classes as these pseudo classes relate to the form or input elements and they also enable selecting the elements based on the HTML attributes so let's start with the very basic yet important input pseudo class that is enabled and disabled the enabled pseudo class represents any enabled element on the HTML document and also if the element is enabled it shows the activated signs like you can click on or set focus on it or maybe type into the disabled class is exactly the opposite of the enabled pseudo class that is it cannot be activated consider a scenario where you have a field to select the age and a button which says proceed to vote now if the entered age is less than 18 years the button will get disabled that is it won't let you proceed further and if the age is greater than 18 years the button stays the same that is stays in enabled state so this is how the enabled and disabled looks like suppose there can be another scenario where there are few fields and they are dependent on each other it means without entering the field details you cannot move on to the next field that is the rest of the fields stay disabled so with the use of enabled and disabled pseudo classes you can programmatically enable or disable user input fields with the help of CSS let's create an example and try these pseudo classes I will create a form let me give a label name an input with type text and a placeholder message similarly let me create three more labels last name email and city along with their input now let's create a button as well all right so in the CSS let me just apply the enabled pseudo class to the input I'll give background color border border radius margin and padding here so when I open the browser you can see the styling which represents that the inputs are enabled right now now if I want few elements to be disabled you may think for that just replace enabled with disabled and get the job done right but this won't work as you can see in the browser the fields are still enabled to disable the fields there is an additional attribute you will have to give to the input and that is 
disabled attribute so this will make the field disabled and if you want to style that field you can use the disabled pseudo class let me give disabled attributes to these fields now when i check the browser you can see the fields are disabled even if i try to click on them it won't let me enter normally the input fields are programmatically enabled or disabled with the help of javascript at runtime but here as we are understanding these pseudo classes we are changing them at design time with the css code so again the disabled pseudo class is used to select the elements which are disabled and disabled means you are not allowed to type anything or select those elements you may have seen or come across some situations where there are certain text fields inside a form which cannot be edited that is they are read only on the other hand elements like h1 paragraph divisions which are not editable at all can also be made editable in this lecture we will see how you can make a field read only or force an element to be editable or typeable let's check this practically inside body i'll give few inputs let me give input tag here with type text and a place holder now let me copy and paste this three more times in the browser you see the inputs let's first try to display them properly so inside style i'll first change the appearance of the document i'll give background color font style and color now i'll say input and we'll give display property as flex we are going to discuss flex in detail when the right time comes but at the moment let me give some margin width border and the border radius all right so now you can see the inputs are displayed properly right now all the inputs are editable which means you are allowed to type inside them as you can see this is the default state in every input but let's say you want to make few inputs read only for that there is an attribute provided by html and it is the read only attribute by giving read only attribute inside any element you can change them to read only let me give read only to this first and third input now if i try to click them you can see it no longer allows me to type if you wish to give some predefined value inside them which cannot be edited you can use the value attribute like this where i give the value here saying this is read only now if you check the browser you can see it's a read only input because i have given the read only attribute there that is another attribute which does the opposite of read only and that is the content editable attribute using this attribute you can make elements like paragraphs or even divisions or headings editable that is you can make these elements typeable fields how let's see that i'll give a div here and we'll define a paragraph inside and i'll give text saying this is an editable paragraph at the moment you see that i cannot select in the browser it won't allow me to type anything but when i give the content editable attribute you can see i can now edit the paragraph from the browser itself even you can make a division as editable so if i remove this paragraph and make this as a division and let me give margin padding background color border color giving the border radius font size and width in the browser you can see now the division and when i try to write something inside division you can see that it allows me to type because of the content editable attribute so this is how you can use the read only and content editable attribute usually when you want to represent these attributes with css there are specific pseudo classes available for read only and writable elements which we see in the next lecture
let's talk about few relative questions how can you make any html element read only well you just give the read only attribute and the element goes uneditable that means you are not allowed to type anything inside those fields the second question is how can you make a non editable html element editable so again the content editable is the attribute which makes any element editable though there are few exceptions but most of the html elements become editable with the content editable attribute now let's look at read only and read write input pseudo classes as their name says the read only pseudo class is used when you want to select the field which are read only whereas with read write it allows selecting the editable fields we will look at the same example which we saw in the previous lecture so to give the read only pseudo class i'll give the element name on which i want to apply the pseudo class i'll say input colon read only this will select all the elements having read only attribute let me give some properties i'll give background color border color and font style let me open the browser and you can see the input with read only attribute is being targeted this pseudo class only works for the elements having the read only attribute so if i remove the read only attribute from the input you can see the input is no longer being targeted so the pseudo classes are used for selecting or targeting specific elements you cannot change the normal flow of the elements with them pseudo classes are selectors they are used for selecting the elements that are in the specific state now let's see the read write pseudo class this pseudo class is used to select the elements which are writable so if i give this pseudo class with input and add a background color and border to it you can see all the input except for the read only are being selected because by default all the inputs are of course writable now if i give comma and div it also selects the div because div has the content editable attribute if i remove this attribute you can see that it no longer targets the division so to summarize the read only pseudo class will select those elements which contain the read only attribute and the read write pseudo class will select the elements which are writable or editable as well as the elements containing the content editable attribute this pseudo class is specifically used to represent the placeholders given inside any input tags or any other elements which consists of placeholder attribute the syntax looks like this where you give the pseudo class that is the colon placeholder dash shown and inside you give the css properties let's see this practically inside the body i define form let me give a label three inputs with type text and two inputs with the placeholder messages now for selecting the placeholder i will say input colon placeholder dash shown and i will give the border and some radius to the border let's check the browser and you can see that the border is displayed because the placeholder is in active state right now while in third input there is no effect because it does not contain any placeholder attribute or message let me type something in the input now if i check the browser you can see the border is no longer displayed because the placeholder is no longer shown or active even if i give a value attribute inside the input you can see the border is still not getting displayed when the page loads in the browser because the placeholder is no longer shown displayed or active 
So placeholder shown is an external state which you give to the placeholder containing elements. Usually any form which collects data will have data validations. For example, a user login form or a sign up form fields will have individual validations or maybe a form collecting employee details have its own business logic validations. For example, employee number cannot be blank or maybe some date validation or for example, salary field should have only numeric values. In case of invalid values entered, if you want to apply CSS for invalid state on a field, then you can use colon invalid pseudo class. The colon valid that is the valid pseudo class does exactly the opposite of invalid pseudo class. In this lecture, we will look at how to select those validation fields with the help of pseudo classes. So let's create a form with validations first and then we will understand the pseudo classes required for them. Let me give a form tag with the class name my form and a label for name and input with type text. Similarly, giving another label for email and an input with type email. Now I will create a label for entering a number. I'll say enter number between 1 to 10, giving an input of type text. Now I'm going to use an attribute for giving validation and that is the pattern attribute. The pattern attribute is used for giving regular expressions which should match the value entered in the form. To know more about regular expression, send me a direct message or you can search for the course from my instructor bio. Okay, so I will give pattern attribute and inside double quotes giving the pattern. I will open the brackets and will say square bracket 1-9 and I end the bracket here. Note that this attribute only works on the input type text fields and not on number fields. I will show the difference as we move ahead. All right, so the structure of the form is ready. Now let's apply some CSS. First, I will give styling to the body. I'll say background color, padding. I'll give 3EM and font family and also color. Now let me give the styling to the form. I'll say dot my form and we'll give display property as inline block with 100% border then border radius to 10 pixel and some padding and for the label i'll give display as flex and margin also giving some alignment for the input i'll give padding 6 pixels margin giving top margin as 2 pixels right and left margin to 30 and bottom 15. I'll give border the radius to 5 pixels with 50% and font size to 1.25 em. So the form looks like this. Now to select the fields which are assigned with some validations the valid and invalid pseudo classes are used. The valid pseudo class is used to select any input or form element whose content validates successfully while the invalid is opposite to valid that is it selects the elements whose contents fail to validate a field contains an invalid state when there is a regular expression returning the invalid state or programmatically it can be achieved so let me give these pseudo classes I'll say input colon invalid setting the background as orange red color to white and border color to brown. Similarly, I'll give input colon valid setting the border color here as well. Let's enter value to the fields. I'll type the name then email and you can see as soon as I started typing it changed the color which we have given inside the invalid pseudo class. 
So this shows that unless I write the proper email, it's not going to validate the field. Same case is with the number field. If I type any number between 1 to 9, it's going to validate. But if I type number which is greater than 10, it's not going to validate. Even if I try to enter text, it's not going to validate despite the input type is text. Let's say if I change the type to number, you can see now I can type here any number I want. Even if the number is greater than 10, it's still showing valid because validation expression is not affecting the type equals number field. These expressions only work for the text fields. So coming back to our topic, which is working with valid and invalid pseudo classes. This is how you can use them to select the fields. Let's talk about a question which is an assignment. Create a form which contains name, email, mobile number and salary fields. The validations are no fields should remain empty. Give validation to name in which first letter should be capital and to mobile number which should contain only 10 digits. All right, so let's figure out the answer. Let me make changes to the current form which we just saw. I'll change the first label to employee name inside input as we want the first letter of the name to be in the uppercase. I will write the pattern A to Z in uppercase, same in the lowercase and I'll say 1 comma 40. This means I want one letter that is the starting letter in uppercase. So I am starting off the pattern with uppercase alphabets. Then for the lowercase alphabets, I have given lowercase a to z and its range up to 40 characters. This won't allow me to type any special characters or numeric values inside this field. Also, we need to make this field mandatory. Therefore, I will give the required attribute. Required attribute is used whenever you don't want the field to be left blank. Okay, so changing the email field to employee email and inside the input, giving the required attribute. I'll change this label to mobile and giving the pattern inside input as 0 to 9 because I want the numeric values between this range. And giving 10 inside curly brackets considering that mobile numbers have 10 digits. Also making this field as required. Adding another label for employee salary and I'll just give the input type as number with required attribute. Well, the CSS is already given. So let's move to the browser. Let me give name starting with a lowercase letter. It shows invalid. Writing the name in uppercase still shows invalid. But if I give the name in the correct pattern, you can see it's valid now. Giving the improper email first, it's showing invalid. And let me give the valid email. So now it is the valid pseudo class getting executed. For the mobile number, let me try to write characters here and you can see it's invalid. Despite I have given the input type as text, but the validation pattern which I have given here won't validate the characters. If I give the 11 digits, you can see it's showing invalid again. Even if I give less than 10 digit number, it's still invalid. Let me enter a proper 10 digit number and you can see it's validated. For the employee salary, I can enter any number here, but the field cannot be left blank. Otherwise, it will remain invalid as I have given the required attribute. So far, we have been switching between code and browser often to check the output. Now I am introducing a VS Code plugin called Live Preview Extension, which will update the changes of HTML CSS code in real time. It means it will update the output as soon as I change the code, which will help to see the exact effect of each line of code. To install the extension, I'll go to extensions icon in the VS code or you can press Ctrl Shift 
x to open the extensions marketplace in the search i will write live preview and you can see it here i'll install this after installing you can see there is an option showing at the top right corner of the vs code screen it says live preview show preview if i click it you can see the html document now whatever changes i apply in the html or css file it gets instantly updated in the live preview this is the charm of it and to make sure that whatever i type where does it effect or where the exact change is happening when i apply the css rule that i want to show you on the fly that's the reason why i am configuring this plugin just for your better understanding in the last lecture we saw what nth child selector is and how to target elements with n as a grouping element by passing n in the arguments now let's further continue to understand the nth child selector by passing more complex arguments in it let me continue with the example which we saw in the previous lecture last when we had done the grouping it was like this as i mentioned there is another version of passing arguments to the nth child and that is by adding the offset value with n like for example let me add the plus sign and 1 now in the output you can see that elements at index 1 4 7 and 10 are selected so the logic will be like this where n starts with 0 that is 3n plus 1 equals to 3 into 0 plus 1 which will be 1 then n becomes 1 so it's 3n plus 1 that is 3 into 1 plus 1 which will be 4 if n becomes 2 then it should be 3 into 2 plus 1 which is 7 and finally n becomes 3 that is 3 into 3 plus 1 which is 10 so it will stop at the index 10 it will go on selecting further if i had defined more elements okay let's see what happens when i replace this 1 with 2 now the logic is changed it will look like this it will start selecting the elements from index 2 till index 11 i hope you understand about how the nth child selects the elements in these kinds of situations because soon enough you will be facing these situations in the live projects of your own let me try it one more time i'll change the number to 3 instead of 2 so it will start selecting the elements from the third index till the 12th index so it will be 3n plus 3 that is 3 into 0 plus 3 which will be 3 then next time it is 3 into 1 plus 3 which is 6 then it goes on 9 12 and so on like if i want to start selecting the elements from fourth fifth or nth position then i can write 3n plus 4 3n plus 5 and so on so nth child selector is really helpful when you want to target the elements at the same time it's just that it will require logic and proper understanding before you use this selector now what if i add negative values to the argument it will absolutely work but instead of going downwards that is top to bottom it will select the elements going upwards that is bottom to top from the starting position so if i write minus 3n plus 9 it's going to start from the ninth position and from that it will go upwards as you can see here now let's say i want to select the elements which are starting at a certain position and ending at a certain position so now you know how to give the start position for the nth element i will say here n plus 3 this will select the elements starting from the third position right now to add the ending position you can group this nth child with another nth child for that i will give colon here 
and use the nth last child selector again and inside I'll give n plus 5. Now this will select the element starting at third position till the element which is at the fifth position from the bottom. As you can see it started from the third position till the eighth index position which is at the fifth position if you calculate from the bottom. Let's make it more interesting. Let me add 3n plus 2 here. So now it will select the elements like 3 into 0 plus 2 that is second index position will be selected 3 into 1 plus 2 that is fifth index position will be selected 3 into 2 plus 2 that is eighth index position will be selected it won't go any further as I have specified the range here that is go up to the nth plus 5 element only so it will stop at the index fifth from bottom as I have given last child here if I remove the nth last child then you can see it goes on selecting the elements even further for the entire table that is. Now let's talk about an assignment. So in this assignment you have to select only the top three and bottom two elements. Your output should look like this. So for that you will separate the selectors with a comma to target the first three elements I will say negative. 1n plus 3 adding the comma here I'll say dot grid item colon nth last child here I'll give 3 to select the third index position again I will give comma dot grid item nth last child I'll give 1 here to select the first index position from the bottom you see that we have selected the elements accordingly this should give you a fair idea about the nth child selector. Pseudo element allows you to style specific parts of the element. For example, first line of the paragraph, first letter of text or even lets you insert or add content before or after the element. Unlike pseudo classes, the pseudo elements are used to style the specific part of an element whereas the pseudo classes are used to style the elements. The syntax for giving the pseudo element is that we first give the double colon notation and then we specify the pseudo element. In older versions of the CSS that is CSS1 and CSS2 colon sign was used to specify pseudo classes and elements both but from the CSS3 double colons are used for pseudo elements only. Pseudo elements are widely used for giving special effects to some selectors. So you do not need to use JavaScript or any other scripts for giving those special effects using the pseudo element only will get the job done. So let's start understanding the pseudo elements. These are the widely used pseudo elements and I will explain each of them in their respective dedicated lectures. The first line pseudo element is used for applying styles to the first line inside an element. Let's understand it with an example. In the body I will create a div and I am defining the paragraph inside. Now in the style I will start by changing the appearance of the body. I will give the background color and changing font and font size. For the paragraph I will give color and some padding. Now I want to select the first line of this paragraph so I will go ahead and write P that is the element selector double colon first line giving the color property here so this will apply color to the first line of the paragraph and you can see the first line of the paragraph is changed the selection of the line by using this pseudo element depends on many factors like width of the element width of the document font size letter spacing or word spacing. 
What I mean is that if you take a closer look at the VS Code window, the paragraph ends here. But on the browser window, the ending is different, even if the next line is starting from below. So the simplest way to cope up with this kind of situation is by giving the break tag. I will write break tag here. And now you can see the text selected by pseudo element. By default, the first line pseudo element will select the line till the browser's width. As soon as the line breaks, the text after that is no longer selected. Also, this pseudo element only works on block level elements. That is when display is set to either block, inline block, table caption or table cell. If it is set on an inline element, nothing happens even if that inline element has a line break within it. Note that not all the properties can be applied in the first line pseudo element. Only the properties which deal with the text can be applied as shown here. Now let's talk about a question. So in which situation the first line pseudo element will not work? As I have discussed, first line pseudo element only works with the block level elements. For example, let's try to give this pseudo element on the span tag instead of paragraph tag. I'll give span tag. Let me change this as well. I'll say span here. You can see that the pseudo element didn't work. Why? because the span is not considered as a block level or block element. But if you still wish to make this work, simply use the display property to the span. I will give the display property here and set it to inline block. You can see the change in the first line of the paragraph. The first letter pseudo element applies styling to the first letter of the first line of any block level element. Earlier in our lectures, we used to target the letters or even a single letter by giving them in a span tag. But now for the same, we will be using the first letter pseudo element. Let's try to understand it practically. I will use the same code which we saw in the previous lecture. So in the style, I will first remove first line pseudo element. We won't be needing that for now. I will give paragraph, double colon, first letter and let me give text transform, uppercase, font size I'll keep 350% and padding as well. This pseudo element will change the first letter of this paragraph. As you can see in the output, letter C is targeted. The rules are same for this pseudo element as well. Just like I said in the previous lecture that it will only work on the block level elements. So if I give span tag instead of paragraph, you can see the pseudo element is not selecting the first letter. But if I set the display property to inline block inside span, now you see that the first letter is again targeted. Do note that if you have both first letter and first line on an element, then the first letter will inherit from the first line styles. But styles on the first letter will be overridden when their styles conflict. Let's check this practically. Giving the first line pseudo element to span, Inside, I will give the text transform property and setting it to lowercase and font size to 0.5 em. Now, if you observe the output, the first letter pseudo element is now overwritten by the properties defined in the first line pseudo element. The first letter is in lowercase as well. To check that, let me open the developers tool. I will click on the span. You can see the styling defined on the right hand side. Here you see the text transform property, right? I will disable it and enable it. 
you can see there is no change in the output. But if I disable the text transform property defined in the first line, the first letter is now in uppercase. Let's try it one more time but with different paragraph. I will add another span and inside I will define the new paragraph using the dummy text. Now once again I will disable the text transform property of first line pseudo element. And you can see when I disable it, it changes back to uppercase letter and when I again enable the property, it changes back to lowercase. And thus the first line pseudo element overrides the first letter pseudo element. This is just something which you should keep in mind while using both these pseudo elements on the same tag. Now let's talk about relative question. So the question is, if you apply both first line and first letter pseudo elements, which will be applied eventually? Well, as we just saw a few moments ago, when we apply both the first line and first letter pseudo element to the same tag, the first line pseudo element will overwrite the properties of the first letter pseudo element if their properties conflict. The before and after pseudo elements are used immensely in front-end development as they allow developers to add content inside the element for creating different effects, gradient effects and much more. So let's start with the before pseudo element. The before pseudo element adds content that appears before an element on a web page. For example, if I give a paragraph and I want to add content before the paragraph starts, so I will use the before pseudo element. I will say p double colon before. This is how the syntax looks. You give the element selector and then the before pseudo element. So whatever CSS rules you give here, the before pseudo element will tell the browser to add those rules before the element. Now the first property which is given to both the before and after pseudo element is the content property itself. Either you keep it blank unless you don't want to add any content before or after the element or you can give content inside. Like for example, I will give a string here. This is the beginning. Now you can see the paragraph starts with a new beginning. But this is not what you think it is. The pseudo element does not add the text inside the paragraph. Rather, it takes a separate space inside the web page. Let me show you what I mean. I will open the developers tool. I will click on the paragraph and you can see the pseudo element. Note that both before and after pseudo elements are not part of the DOM as they do not have any element type and for this reason they simply don't exist inside the DOM. So giving the string or text inside them is not a viable option as there is no way you can further access the text inside the DOM. Apart from string you can give various other values as per the requirement, keywords, image values, string value, alt text for defined content, counter values, attribute value, position dependent keywords. Note that without the content property these pseudo elements are useless. So it's better to keep it blank and after that whatever styling you give below that will be applied to the content. So again to summarize the before pseudo element lets you add the content before the selected element. Now let's talk about a relative question which is an assignment. So the assignment is create a navbar and apply hover effect with before pseudo element as shown here. 
so the result which looks like this to achieve it i will start with the ul tag and inside i'll create four links that is home about services and contact so now you see the links are displayed now let's change the appearance i will start with the body giving the background color font family text alignment center let me give margin and padding now let's style the ul i'll first give the position absolute why am i giving the absolute position because right now there is no other ancestor element of ul with the positioned property so it will use the document body and move along with the page scrolling then i will align the ul by giving top to 50% and left to 50% giving the transform property now this property is used for transforming the element to 2d and 3d you can rotate scale skew or move the elements i will give the translate value minus 50% minus 50% this will bring the content to the center all right now i will give margin and display property as well and i will remove the list style that is the bullets for that i am giving the list style property to ul and li i will set it to none then giving the ul li and anchor tag together as i want all these to share the same styling i am separating them with space because they all are nested elements if they were defined separately then i would have used a comma to separate them i will give position to relative display to block padding margin this i have calculated by looking at the output text decoration to none text transformation to upper case the color and i'll make it bold now you can see the navbar is looking i'll use the before pseudo element on ul li and anchor i'll give the blank content property first this will allow me to apply some effects above the element i will give the position to absolute top left width 100% height the same that is 100% border top now this will set the border on top of the element as you can see similarly border bottom once again giving the transform property scale y and scale value itself is used to resize the element's width and height on the 3d plane as i've used the scale y it will resize the y axis to the plane right now i will set the opacity to 0 so you can see the borders are not being displayed they are still there but the opacity is zero right now finally transition property i'll set it to 0.6 seconds and let me give the hover effect to these elements this is the syntax if you want to use the hover with the pseudo elements i will copy the transform property defined above and i'll change it to 1 and opacity also to 1 I have created the navbar with some basic hover effect using the before pseudo element. Just like the before pseudo element, the after pseudo element is used to insert the content after the element. In other words, it creates a pseudo element that is the last child of the selected element. Just like we saw in the previous lecture, I will define after pseudo element here. Right now I am keeping the content blank. Let me go to the developer tool for a moment. I will click on the paragraph tag and you can see the after pseudo element is added after the element. Just like the before pseudo element, the after pseudo element is inline by default. So I will give some content here. I will write begin in the before pseudo element. Also let me give color similarly inside after pseudo element i will write 
end and we'll give color to it so if you take a look you can see that the before and after pseudo elements are adding the content in line this is their default behavior generally the before and after pseudo elements are also used to avoid a situation called container collapsing this situation occurs while using the float property on the elements in which all the child elements are floated but the parent element fails to float and it collapses eventually float and container collapsing are broader concepts in itself so i will be covering that in a dedicated lecture i am mentioning this because these pseudo elements that is before and after are used to avoid the collapsing situation which we will go through later on now let's talk about a relative question so show the practical use of after pseudo element i'm going to continue with the nav bar which we were making in the previous lectures assignment so this is where we ended up last time i'm going to copy this styling both the before pseudo element and hover and i will paste it below i will give after pseudo element instead of before i'll first remove the opacity from the hover as well as from the after pseudo element in the transform property i will change this scale y to only scale and i will set it to 0 now you know the use of scale it defines a two dimensional scale transformation next i will remove these borders and instead i will give a background color in the output you can see when hover takes place the background is not aligned properly for that i will change the top property i will give one pixel to it if you look at the hover now it is perfectly aligned the only problem is how will we make the text appear on the top of the background for that i will specify the z index property this property is used to avoid the overlapping situations of elements that is the stack order of the elements this we will understand in a dedicated lecture as well also this property works on the positioned elements that is the elements whose position is either set to absolute relative or any other value rather than static i will set the z index or z index to minus 1 and by this the background will go backwards as you can see when i hover the text is displayed along with the background so this is how you use the after and before pseudo elements in your projects you can give various effects to the elements by using them the css font family rule allows the developers to change the font of selected elements it contains a specific list of font family names and generic family names for the selected element let me first of all explain what is the difference between font family and generic family the font family holds several font names while the generic family contains limited fonts which are used as fallback mechanism if the browser does not support the font name given to font family to check this practically i will give a paragraph inside the body in the styles i will first style the document page that is the body giving the background font size and color i'll give the paragraph selector next in which let me say font dash family you can see the list of various font families it displays it's going to show the list of fonts which are available on your device i can select any of the font families from this and that will be applied to the paragraph let me select this one and you can see the font of the paragraph is changed remember that the font which is being selected is not a single font but a family and always it is the first font that is being applied to the selected element the font family always specifies the list of fonts from highest to lowest and every font is separated by a comma if the browser fails to recognize the first font it will move on to the second font and so on 
So this is how the syntax of font family looks like. You give the selector and then you define the property that is the font family. Also when using the font family, you should always include at least one generic family name like here you can see sans serif. Even if I change the font family, you can see at the end serif is given. Now what does generic family mean? They are prioritized list of fonts which are available locally in every device. So if any of the fonts from the font family are not recognized by the browser, then the browser will move to the generic font family. One more important point is that the generic font family is always written without giving any quotation marks. You can give double quotes or single quotes to write any non-generic font but for the generic font family you do not specify any quotation as they work as a fallback mechanism. So it is very important to specify a generic family in every font stack you define. If you don't specify a generic family, the browser will set it to default which is whatever the default font is used by the user's system. Also there will be font names which contain spaces between them like the one which I have currently given. For the fonts which have spaces between their names, you always write them in single or double quotes. So this was a detailed discussion about the font family rule. Now let's talk about questions. So what will happen if you specify a generic font in the beginning of the font stack? Well there is nothing wrong with it. If you want to give priority to the generic font then you can set it at the beginning of the font stack. But then the rest of the font family will be meaningless because browsers anyhow can read the generic font name. So it is a good practice to give the generic font name at the end of every font stack. The font face CSS rule allows you to load custom fonts on a web page. When we add the CSS rule inside the style sheet, it will instruct the browser to download the font from where it is hosted and then displays it as specified. In a shorter way, the font face rule will allow you to not only use the external fonts to your web page but also allow you to give your own font name. Now before diving into this lecture, let me highlight few points regarding what this at is. In CSS, there are some statements which tell or instruct the CSS how to behave. These statements are referred to as CSS at rules. There are several at rules, each having their own uniqueness in handling different conditional situations. We will see them as and when required. Alright, getting back to font face rule, let's try some practical implementation. I am defining a paragraph here. Let me give p tag and inside some content. Let me also give a heading at font face. Let's move to the CSS part. Now before giving any styling, I'll first define at font face rule. Not that it's going to create any errors, but generally in the front end development, when we want to use the at font face rule, we define it first before any styling as a part of standard practice. So I will give the font face rule and press enter. And you can see that it gives the font family and source that is the URL properties by default. This is how the syntax looks. In the font family, we can give any custom name. For example, I give the name heading font and in the SRC, we have to give the path of the font which we have downloaded. So if I open my project folder, you can see I have the fonts folder where I have downloaded few fonts. Now these fonts are not installed in the system nor they would get displayed in the font family property. Alright, so back to the code window, I'll give the path, I'll say assets slash fonts slash 
and you can see it shows the path. I'll press enter and the downloaded fonts are displayed. Let me select this one for heading. Similarly, I'll give another font face rule for the paragraph. I'll give the font family name as paragraph font and I'll give the path for the font. So the fonts are set. Now I will give styling to the body. I'll say background color, font size and color. Next I'll style H1 giving the font family as heading font which we have described in the font face rule. Text align to center. Font size I'll slightly increase and lastly the color. And for the paragraph, I'll just define the font family property. I'll say paragraph font. Now, if we look at the output, you can see the fonts which we have given in the font face rule are applied according to the heading and the paragraph. So this rule is very helpful when you want to give external fonts to the elements. There can be certain situations where you want certain type of font format in your web page. In that case, you can specify the font format inside the format function. Like here, you can see at the end of the font path, the format is specified. These are the different font formats available. They were created as per the older to newer browser compatibility. Nowadays, the web open font format that is WOFF and WOFF2 are widely used as they are wrapper for the older font formats like open type and true type font formats. So now let's talk about relative questions. The question is how will you specify the true type, the embedded open type and web open font format in the font face rule. For true type you will give the true type in the format function. For EOT that is the embedded open type you will give embedded dash open type in the format function and for the web open fonts you will give the WOFF or WOFF2 in the format function. The CSS font weight property is used for making the font thick or bold. The font weight property accepts either a keyword value or numeric value. Let's check this practically. Inside the body, I will define a paragraph. Now inside style, I'll first give the background color and font size 1.2 em color and text align property to center. Next the paragraph, I'll give font size and the font weight property giving the keyword bold and you can see how it makes the paragraph bold. When the bold keyword is given to the font weight, that means it is equivalent to the value 700. So if I give 700 instead of bold, there will be no change in the thickness of the font, which you can see. If I give normal in font weight, then this is the default thickness of every element when the browser loads, even if I comment the property you can see there is no change in the paragraph's thickness. The normal keyword is equivalent to the value 400. So any value greater than 400 will add weight to your fonts and values less than 400 decreases the font weight. The font weight also depends on the font family which you use. If I give lighter to the font weight, then you can see there is no change in the paragraph because whatever default font family is assigned to the page, it does not allow any decrease in weight from this point unless I change the font family. Let's change the font family. I'll give this one as font family and you can see as soon as the font family changes, the font weight decreases to lighter which is equivalent to value 100. So if a font has a bold 700, or normal 400 or even lighter that is 100 version as part of the font family the browser will use that and if those are not available the browser will mimic its own bold normal or lighter version of the font.
let's talk about the questions the question is in which case the font weight will fail to work as we just saw the working of the font weight depends on which font family has been assigned if the font which you are using does not have those weights in existence then the browser is very likely to round the numbers to the closest weight it can find for that font and that leads to failure of the given font weight the css line height property is very useful when you want to set the height of the line box that is the distance between the lines of text so if you want to give some amount of space above or below the line elements the line height property will get the job done let me show you how i will start by defining an h1 in the body i'll say line height property next i will give a paragraph and let's give the address as a footer so i will define the footer tag first and inside i'll give the address now let's style the page i'll give background color color and font family to the body next i'll style the heading i'll give color and will align the heading to center let me give font size as well now for the paragraph i will give line height as 1.7 and you can see each line of paragraph leaves some space the line height property can accept keyword values like normal and none as well as the number length or percentage values so if i give 35 pixels instead of 1.7 you can see how the paragraph adjusts the line height accordingly further if i give a percentage value let's say 95% you can see it reduces the space between the lines the line height also depends upon the size of the font so if i give font size of about 1.2 em then you can notice the change in the line height how does this work well if you specify the line height property along with the font size the line height value will get multiplied with the font size value after that the browser computes the result and sets the line height accordingly the recommended method to give the line height is by using the number value only which is also known as unitless line height giving the unitless line height value is recommended because sometimes if there is a length or percentage value assigned to line height it is possible that the browsers leave some extra spaces between the lines after computing the line height but if i give line height to let's say inside address i set the line height to 1.6 and font size to 20 pixels let me also change the color now the font size gets multiplied with the line height that is 20 into 1.6 which is equivalent to 32 pixels so the browser will set the line height to 32 pixels let's talk about relative questions the first question is why is line height important it's important because it increases the readability of the text but apart from readability giving proper line height is also necessary if the line spacing is too large there can be too much white space and the text will look awkward if the line spacing is too small all the letters will appear as if they are squished together the next question is why is it ideal to give the unitless value to the line height as i discussed giving the unitless line height value is recommended because sometimes if there is a length or percentage value assigned to line height it is possible that the browsers leave some extra spaces between the lines after computing the line height The CSS font style property is very useful when you want to give some additional styles. It has three possible values that is italic, oblique and normal. So let's see a few practical examples. Inside body I want to define two paragraphs. I will give a paragraph tag with a class attribute. 
giving another paragraph tag and giving a class name here as well. All right, now for the styling, I'll start with body. I'll give background color, font family, color and font size. I want to give font style as oblique to paragraph one. So I will select the paragraph using the class selector. I'll say dot my paragraph one and setting the font style to oblique and also giving the color property. Similarly, for selecting the second paragraph, I'll use the class selector and will set font style to italic and color to deep sky blue. Usually the italic fonts are more cursive, that is they are less slant compared to oblique font style. Whereas the oblique font style is more sloped than the rest of the font style. Sometimes it is hard to identify the difference between an italic style and an oblique style because most of the time they are specified on the regular font. But if you give the font which is embedded with an italic style, then the difference can be seen. Italic is a special version of the font whereas the oblique version is just the regular version that is a bit inclined. And last is just the normal. So if I give normal here, you can see how the style looks. The CSS text transform property is used for controlling the text case that is upper or lower case and capitalization of the text. The text transform property provides the following values. First is the lower case which will convert all the letters or characters to lower case. Second is the uppercase which converts to uppercase and third is the capitalize which will convert only the first letter of every word to uppercase. Rest of the characters remain unchanged that is will stay in their original state. Let's check them practically. I'll define a heading and a paragraph inside the body. I'll say h1 giving the heading as text transform property and a paragraph. Next, I'll apply the style to body with the background, font family, color and font size. Adding styles to H1 now, I'll give color and text transform property to capitalize. And now you can see every first letter of the heading is in uppercase. Now let's check both the values on paragraph that is uppercase and lowercase one by one. I will give the value lowercase first. And you can see the paragraph is now converted to lowercase. I'll change the value to uppercase and the paragraph is converted to uppercase. If I set it to none, it will bring the paragraph to its default state which is anyway not needed. Now if I give the text transform property uppercase or lowercase with none, then the none value gets overridden as you can see. One more point to remember is that the capitalize will not change the letters coming after the numbers. Let me create a span tag and inside I'll give the date like this. Now if I give capitalize to the span, you can see the letter T in the TH is not in uppercase as the letter is coming after a numeric value that is 5. If I add only letter before 5, you can see it is getting converted to uppercase. So capitalize will not affect the letters which are coming after a numeric value. Let's talk about a question. So how can you change the case using CSS? It's basically using the text transform property. You can convert the text into upper, lower or capitalized cases. The CSS font variant property allows you to change the targeted text to small caps. In a small caps font, all lowercase letters are converted to uppercase letters. However, the converted uppercase letters appear in a smaller font size than the original uppercase letters in the text. Let's see this practically. I'll give a paragraph inside the body and giving some formatting to the body also. Now applying the font variant property to the paragraph, I'll say small caps and you can see how the small caps text looks. 
they are all in uppercase but with a smaller font size. This property is basically used on the heading, subheading or on the elements which hold meaningful content. Another property derived from the font variant property is font variant caps. Now this property offers few different variants to control the capital letters. So if I just go ahead and give the font variant caps, you can see the list of values which can be given. I'll select all small caps. It converted the uppercase letter to small capital letter. Let me try the unicase here. And it's a mixture of upper and lower case letters, as you can see in the output. It displays both the small capital as well as the lower case letters. Next is the titling caps. This value is a variant of uppercase designed specially for headings and titles. But if the font which you use for titles doesn't support this feature, then the property has no visible effect. So this is what the font variant property is. Before CSS3, it only allowed two possible values, that is normal and small caps. But as it got extended in CSS3, it offered more variants for the text. The CSS text decoration property allows you to add and decorate the lines, underlines, overlines, line through or a combination of lines on a selected text. There were individual decoration properties used for decorating the text, be it a line, color, style or size decoration. But now there is a shorthand available for declaring all these properties in a single line and that is the text decoration property. Let's check some practical examples. I will define a paragraph inside the body. I'll give text here saying this is the example of text decoration property. Let me give some basic styling to the body. I'll select the paragraph tag by using the element selector. First, let's bring this text to the middle of the page. I'll give margin top to 10 em. Now I'll give text decoration and you can see the list of values it displays. Let me select underline, space, dotted space color space and finally the size that is the thickness so this is how the text decoration is defined this is the correct approach of using the text decoration shorthand property we first give the text decoration line we separate the next value by giving a space then text decoration style then text decoration color and finally the thickness. Now talking about values if I change this to overline instead of underline you can see the dotted line goes above the text that is over the text. Next if I change this line to line through the line style to dashed you can see now the line is on the text. You can also define multiple lines for any element like if I give overline and underline, you can see the result, but you cannot define more than one line style or color. There is one additional property which you can give particularly when the text decoration contains an underline. And that property is text underline offset. Now this property sets some offset distance, some space between the text and the underline. So if I want to give some space here between the underline and text, I'll say text underline offset and we'll set it to 10 pixels. And you can see it added some space between underline and the text. So this is how the property works. Remember text underline offset is not part of the text decoration shorthand. While an element can have multiple text decoration lines, Text underline offset only impacts the underlining and not the other decorations like overline or line through. And finally, if you do not want any decorations, you can simply give none. By giving none, all the existing decorations will be removed from the element. Even the element which comes with predefined decorations such as an anchor tag coming with an underline. 
let me give an example of anchor tag i'll give a reference and name here all the anchor tags are by default shown with an underline as they represent a hyperlink say if you want to remove this underline which generally happens when we create menu items then you can simply set the text decoration value to none and you can see the underline gets removed so let's talk about a question or a practical implication of this text decoration property explain a practical usage of text decoration property if that's the question or i may ask you that how will you remove the underline from an anchor tag so most of the time you see that text decoration property is used when there are sites containing menu like design generally to create a menu you have to use the anchor tag but when you put anchor tag it comes with an underline to remove that you can practically implement this let me show you an example quickly i'll create a div containing three anchor tags home about and contact let me bring these links to the middle of the page i'm giving text align font family font size and margin to the div then for the anchors i'll change the color giving some padding let's say about 12 pixels and the text decoration property i'll set it to none so this is how the menus are created usually we don't keep the underline for the anchors while creating the menu so we remove them with the help of text decoration property if you further wish to design it you can add simple hover effect i'll set the hover effect by giving background color border radius and transition of about 0.8 seconds and there we have our menu css allows us to give the alignment to the text by using the text align property it sets the horizontal alignment for the content given inside the inline block element or table cell this property accepts one of the six values that is left right center start end and justify left is the default value content aligns along the left side start is the same as left but the text direction will be from left to right right aligns the content along the right side and end is same as right but the text is from right to left center will bring the content to the center and justify will actually stretch the text until it fills the width of the web page or container as well as it also makes sure that each line has equal width so let's see this practically i'll define three paragraphs inside the body not to mention that giving some body formatting next i'll give the text align property to paragraph it is already left aligned which is the default alignment for all the elements let me make it right aligned and you can see all the letters get aligned to the right instead of right if i change it to end you can see there is no change in the alignment that is it still remains right aligned but the text direction is from right to left let me give center align you can see the moment i try to change the value it gets back to its default state that is the left alignment because that's the browser's tendency to set every element to left as default if no alignment is found as it is easier for users to read or find the start of the sentence and you can see the letters are center aligned now if i set it to justify it stretches the text to match the width of the web page let's talk about a question explain the difference between end versus right alignment and left versus start alignment basically the end alignment and the right alignment are the same they both will align the content to its right side but the end is used alongside the direction property to adjust the direction as well as the alignment but the right will keep your text to the right side no matter what direction is given similarly the left align and start align 
will align the content to the left side but the only difference is that the start align will align the content to the left if the flow of the text that is the direction is left to right but if the direction is from right to left then start will align to the right the css text indent property allows you to add some horizontal space before the beginning of the first line the horizontal space is applied with respect to the starting edge of the line that is left or right the text indent property accepts the values in length format or in percentage format also for the length it accepts negative length values so let's see how to use this property i'll define three paragraphs inside the body and let me give some basic styling to the body with the padding now let's indent these paragraphs i'll give text indent up to 5 em and you can see the indentation is applied to the first line of all the paragraphs now if i change it to 50% you can see it adds more space before the starting of the paragraph if you want to give indentation only to the second and third paragraphs you can use the adjacent selector and you have the required result let's try giving negative values i'll give minus 15 pixels and you can see the indentation is more towards the left side basically text indentation is used to display the paragraph or a line properly on the web page generally the text indent property adds the indentation on the left side but if you want to indent the text from the right side you can always change the direction of the line by specifying the direction property i'll give the direction to rtl that is the direction will go from right to left and text indent to 3 em now you see the indentation is applied from the right side so this was about the text indent property it is used for adding some more indentation some space generally before the beginning of the line now let's talk about a question so how to apply right indentation to give the right indentation you will have to change the flow of text direction from left to right as by default the direction is from the left so by using the direction property you can change the direction of the text to right and then you can give the indentation the css color property sets the color that is the foreground color value of an element's text or text decorations color property is very useful and an important part of design and development when creating websites with the use of color property inside your style sheet you can set color of any element which is available within your html document So for example let me define a paragraph inside the body and let's try to change the color of the paragraph but first let me give styling to the body as usual now for applying color to the paragraph i'll give the color property and will set it to orange and you can see the paragraph's color is now orange with css these are four possible ways to define or assign colors The one which we saw is just the color name. Other three ways to define or assign colors are by giving either hexadecimal value, the RGB value or HSL value. We will see each of them in detail in the forthcoming sections. Now let's talk about a question so what is the use of color property in CSS or the same question is how do you change the foreground color or text color of an element so it is the color property which helps you to change the text or foreground color of an element colors play a vital role in making a web page by default all the html elements you add inside your web pages appear in either black or white but by addition of colors inside the document you can add a lot of visual interest to your page and css makes it easy for you to customize the colors of your own liking and assign them to the elements 
and that's what we are going to learn in this section. Various places where you can apply color are the foreground color, that is the text color, background color of the elements, border color, text decorations, carrot color, shadow or box shadow color, outline color and much more. We will learn different ways or methods to assign color values such as RGB, hexadecimal or HSL in detail. So let's dive into this colorful section that is using colors with CSS. So far we have seen giving the color to the elements by using the keywords that is the color names. Now let's discuss another method of giving color to the elements which is by using the RGB values. Let's first understand what RGB is. RGB stands for red, green and blue which are three hues of light that can be mixed together for creating various colors. This method that is combining red, green and blue light is the standard method for producing color images which you see on your television, smartphone or desktop screens. Now let's take a look at few practical examples for RGB values. First I will define a paragraph inside the body and will apply the styling after that. Now let's give few styling to the body. Next I'll apply color property to the paragraph. I'll say RGB and you can see the value here. I'll press enter. By default it contains these values that is red, green and blue. The number of colors supported by RGB depends on how many possible values can be used for red, green and blue respectively. This is known as color depth which is measured in bits. The number of bits indicates how many colors are available for each pixel. For example, in black or white image, only two colors are needed. This means the color depth of the image is one bit. The most common color depth is 24 bit color, also known as true color. It supports eight bits of each of the three colors, that is eight bits of red, 8 bits of green and 8 bits of blue, making 24 bits in total. That's why in 24 bit color the RGB value ranges from 0 to 255. In RGB you will have to pass numeric values between 0 to 255. 0 means 0 saturation that is the color is absent and 255 means 100% saturation of that color. So if I give 255 in red and rest I keep 0, you can see that the paragraph color changed to red. Now internally it looks something like this where we have three layers that is red, green and blue on the default black layer. Right now as the value of red is set to 255 which is at maximum saturation and the green and blue are set to 0 which is zero saturation, hence only the red color is being displayed. Similarly, if I give 255 to green and rest I keep zero, you can see the green color getting displayed on the paragraph. Similarly for blue as well. Now let's say if I lower the value of red to 150 and rest I keep zero, you can see it got a bit darker because now the layer of red has less saturation compared to the max saturation. Let me give a proper RGB value. I'll give 218 for red, 165 for green and 32 for blue. And you can see it generates a yellow like color. So this is how the RGB value works. If you wish to change the opacity of the color, you can add an additional keyword that is A to the RGB value. A stands for alpha, that is the opacity of the final color and not any individual red, green or blue color. So if I give 0.7 as opacity, you can see the opacity getting changed. You can also give percentage values as well, like if I give here 40% instead of 0.7, the opacity is still getting affected. 
So this was all about using RGB values for applying colors to the elements. Let's talk about some basic questions. The first is how do you define RGB color in CSS? So to define the RGB color for any element, you have to use the following syntax. You give RGB and inside these brackets, you give three values for red, green and blue, which is ranging from zero to 255. The next question, why does RGB values go till 255 only? So as discussed in RGB, each channel that is red, green and blue is of 8 bits. Thus, it limits the range of 0 to 255. That's why the minimum and maximum value you can give in RGB is 0 and 255. So total is 256. That is 8 bits. Hexadecimal notations in CSS is a way of representing a hexadecimal or a hex value of color. This is the widely used way to specify colors in CSS. Hex values are actually just a different way to represent RGB values. Instead of giving three values between 0 to 255, you use six hexadecimal numbers. Hex value is always given between 0 to 9 and A to F, where A is equal to 10, B is 11, C is 12 and so on, prefixed by the hash sign. When styling an element with CSS, you will often change the color code values for properties like font color, background color, border color, etc. To create custom colors, you can use combinations of the hexadecimal numbers as shown earlier. So the correct way to define a hex code is, it must start with a hash sign followed by six digits of hexadecimal value. Each pair of two digits represents red, green and blue. So the pattern will look like this. Thus the colors are represented in the combination of red, green and blue blue values. Let's talk about values which are used in hexadecimal notations. The lowest value is 00, zero which is the darkest version of the color that is closest to black and the highest value FF is the lightest version of the color that is closest to white. For example, if I want to give color to a paragraph, first I will define a paragraph inside the body. Now, just like we saw in the RGB, 0 means 0 saturation and 255 means maximum saturation. So, if I want to give red color using hex value, I will give hash FF to the first pair which is red and the rest I will keep 0. And you can see this gives the red color. Hex values are not case sensitive, so if I write this code in uppercase instead of lowercase, you can see it still shows the red color. But you should always follow a strict syntax rule while writing the hex code, whether you keep them in all upper or lowercase. Ideally, we see people using the lowercase often. Okay, so moving on to give green and blue color, the values will be like this. Or you can use the shorthand notations for the same. This three digit shorthand is where you combine the duplicate digits from each color component into one. Where R represents red component, G represents green and B represents blue component. For example, if I give a color code like this where I say hash FF double A double four you can see every color component has duplicate value. So if I reduce the duplicate values, the code becomes hash F, A and 4, which still gives the same color. So to convert a six digit code into three, simply reduce the duplicate values from each color component. So by changing the amount of red, green and blue, you can create a variety of colors like here, if I give hash 31D2A4, it's going to create a shade closer to green, which you can see. 
Further, if I wish to add an alpha value, that is the opacity or transparency to the color, the format of hex code will be like this, where the last pair denotes the opacity of the color, which is also a hex value. So if I give 95 here, you can see the opacity getting changed. Let me change it to E4 instead of 95 and you can see again the opacity is changed. So lowering the value will cause the visibility to become fainter and fainter until it becomes transparent and increasing the value will cause the visibility to become more and more opaque. Now let's talk about relative questions. So how do you assign color using hex value shorthand notations? By giving a three digit hex value code for colors, that is when a normal six digit hex value contains duplicate color component values, we can reduce those duplicate values and convert the six digit hex code into a three digit hex code for that color. And this does not affect the color, that is the color will remain the same. The next question is, how is the hexadecimal value calculated or how does the hexadecimal color work in CSS? As we know the hexadecimal base is 16, so the color range is from 0 to 9 and A to F. Suppose we have an RGB color in which the amount of red, green and blue is 69, 16 and 182. Now as the base value is 16 for hexadecimal, each value in RGB is divided by 16. So 69 divided by 16 gives quotient as 4 and remainder as 5. So the hex value for red 69 becomes hash 45. Similarly, dividing 16 with 16 gives quotient as 1 and remainder as 0. So the hex value of green 16 becomes hash 10. And by dividing 182 with 16, the quotient will be 11 and remainder will be 6, making the hex value of blue as hash 116. But as we have alphabets denoting the numeric values from 10 to 15, the value 11 becomes B. So the hex value of RGB 69 16 and 182 will be hash 45 10 B6. This is how the hex values are calculated. The HSL which stands for hue, saturation and lightness is a CSS function which allows you to provide colors by specifying hue, saturation and light components of the color. The HSL model is very easy to use and understand compared to the RGB color model because the HSL model allows you to select a base hue and then adjust its saturation and lightness as desired. Just like we saw in RGB, the HSL function accepts the HSL values as parameters. It takes up to three values, that is the first value will be considered as hue, second as saturation and third as lightness, each separated by a comma. Alright, so let's break down the values. First is the hue. It can be easily identified by looking at this color wheel. Starting from 0th degree till 359, the different colors are applied, that is the saturation of one color decreases and the next color's saturation increases. Here 0 degree is red, 120 degree is green and 240 degree is blue. If we talk about 60 degree for example, it is 50% of red, 50% of green which is represented as yellow. Similarly 300 degree is 50% of blue and 50% of red which represents magenta. All these values are represented as different angles inside the color cycle of the hue component. So you can either give values as an angle in degrees, for example 230 degree or just the number 230 itself. 
the second value that is saturation is represented in percentage it represents the amount of saturation given to the color for example a hundred percent saturation is fully saturated that is more colorful and intense while the zero percent is no opacity of hue finally the third value that is the lightness just like saturation the lightness is also given in percentage value so the zero percent lightness means black and hundred percent is white to understand lightness we can visualize a bar where the gradient starts with black at zero percent and ends at hundred percent with pure white and this gradient passes through the color obtained with the given h and s values all right so let's apply colors using hsl function i'll start by defining a paragraph inside the body now in the style i'll select paragraph and i'll define the color property to it i'll write hsl and press enter and you can see it shows me the hue saturation and lightness i am giving hue as 30 degrees saturation as 100 percent and lightness as 50 percent so it gives me an orange like color now let's say if I tweak the saturation a little bit, I'll make it 70%. You can see it gives me a different shade of orange. What you can make out of this, that unless you change the hue of the color, changing the saturation and lightness will give you different shades of the given hue. And if I change the hue, let me make it 330. You can see it gives me entirely a different color. So changing the saturation and lightness will help you to set different version of the given hue. Once you have picked your hue, it's just a matter of adjusting the saturation and lightness until you get it right. Lastly, if you wish to add opacity, you can use the HSLA function and you can set up the alpha value. Like here you see, when I give 0.7, you have a different opacity. So now let's talk about an assignment. Create a circle shape and assign rainbow colors using HSL color value. All right, so first to define a shape, I'll create a blank division inside the body. And now all the magic that remains will be done inside the CSS. So let's move to the styling part. I'll first change the background color of the body. Next, I'll style the div. I'll give width and height. 200 pixels, margin top 120 pixels, padding 110 pixels. We cannot see the div right now because we haven't applied any color to it. So let's apply the colors. I'll give the background property and the value which I'll use here is linear gradient function. This function sets a linear gradient as the background image and to create a linear gradient we must assign two or more colors to it. So let's give the colors. We will learn about gradients used in CSS in absolute details as that's going to be our next topic. All right, after giving linear gradient function, the first value it takes is the angle. So I will give about 90 degrees and then I'll start defining the colors. So you can see the div now. Right now it's a square. Let's change the radius so it becomes circular. I'll give border radius to 50% and you can see it is a circle. Lastly, we have to align the div to center and it is empty. We cannot use the text align property. So I will have to use the margin property to align it. I'll first set the position as absolute then the margin left and margin right to auto also i'll give left and right as zero both these properties that is left and right are used only when the element has a position property assigned to it and now you can see we have achieved our final result
up till now we have seen the opacity used with RGB, HSL and hexadecimal values and how it affects the colors. There is a property called opacity which is used to set the transparency for an element. It was introduced in CSS3 to enable the developers to set the transparency of any HTML element. The opacity property controls how opaque an element is on the scale of 0 to 1 that is 0.0 to 1.0. Lower the value, more transparent the element becomes. So let's try to set the opacity of an element using this property. I will first define an image tag inside the body. I'll give SRC alternative title in case of image fails to load and I will also set width about 500 pixels and you can see the image getting displayed. All right, let's set the opacity. I'll give image selector and inside I'll define the opacity about let's say one that is 1.0 internally. This is the maximum opacity you can give to any element. So this is how the syntax looks. You define the property and then you specify the alpha value that is the amount of transparency which should be applied to any element. Now let's try to lower it. I'll give 0.6 and you can see the opaqueness of the image getting lighter. So the opacity property is used to make an image transparent by lowering the opacity value. The lowest value you can give is 0 that is 0.0. .0 that will make your image fully transparent as you can see. You can also give opacity to the text like for this paragraph. If I try to give opacity to 0.5, then you can see the text's opacity being adjusted. If you want to be more precise, that is a value between 0.5 and 0.6, you can add precision by adding one more decimal value where I say 0.55. Generally, this is not the correct approach of giving opacity. Particularly to the text, we embed the opacity with the color property values that is RGBA, HSLA or hexadecimal notations with alpha value. Just like declaring the background of an element to be a solid color, in CSS you can declare that background to be a gradient. Instead of giving an actual image for a background, declaring gradients is better for control and performance. Gradients are typically one color that fades into another. But in CSS, you can control every aspect of it. Like from giving the direction to the colors, as many as you want till controlling the color changes, you can control it all. So let's begin with the linear gradient function. This function allows you to give a linear gradient to any element. The gradient you apply will blend from one color to the next like this. In linear gradient, the gradient line can go upwards, downwards, left, right or diagonal. Let's see implementation of linear gradient function practically. I am going to define an empty article tag and will apply gradient to it. Let's apply the gradient. I'll write article here and inside I'll give some margin and padding. Now the linear gradient function can be applied with any properties which deal with background of the elements like background image, background, border image, etc. But it cannot be used with color properties that is color or background color as the gradient belongs to the image data type. They can only be used where images can be used. Though you can also give gradients to the text, but that is a different concept which we will cover as we move along. Okay, so I will give background property here and linear gradient function. First, let me define two colors so that we can know how the default gradient looks. You can see it creates a gradient in a single straight line which is by default to bottom direction. So if I set the direction here to bottom, you can see there is no change happening. Linear gradient function takes all these positional or directional keyword values prefixed with 2. 
so if i give to right instead of to bottom you can see the change in gradient direction changes to the right if i change it to left the gradient direction changes to the left if i change it to bottom left the gradient goes to the bottom left corner so this is how you can control the direction of the gradient with keyword values instead of giving directions like this you can directly specify the angle for example if i give an angle to the gradient line 55 degrees then the gradient will shift towards that angle as you can see also you can give the gradient in the reverse direction by giving a negative number to degree let's give minus 55 degrees and why only two colors let's add few more color values to this gradient and you can see how the gradient adjusted as another color was added if i change the angle to 108 degrees the gradient line will change accordingly let's reset to 0 degree you can also customize your gradient by adding color stop points on the gradient line a color stop position can be defined by giving length or percentage value to the color which will affect the transition of the gradients so here if i add color stop positions 10 40 60 and 90% you can see the gradient transition getting changed so this is how you can control the transition by giving color stop positions for rgb values the color stop positions are defined this way so now let's talk about questions first is what are color stops in css gradient color stops are specific positions on the gradient line which tells the browser where to stop the gradient transition they are basically used to render the colors with smooth transitions it consists of the color value followed by an optional stop position which can be in percentage or length value the next question is an assignment where you have to create the following pattern using linear gradient function so let's begin we already have the article tag defined so let's continue with that i'll clear out the styles defined in article then i'll define padding 12m for top left right and bottom next i'll give linear gradient so i'll write background and linear gradient i'll give 135 degrees which will define a color and i'm adding a transparency effect by giving transparent and stopping point i am setting it to 25% you can see the gradient at the top left corner this is how we will be creating a diamond pattern with linear gradient that is by applying gradient to the corners until it creates a diamond shape so i will copy this linear gradient function and paste it three more times i'll change the angle to 225 degrees 315 and 45 degrees and now you see it makes a diamond shape now this is where applying the color stop will help let me give 30% to the first gradient and you can see how it changed the top left corner i'll give 30% as color stop position to all the remaining gradients and finally if you wish to change the color you can give background color and we have achieved the pattern so your assignment is done the radial gradient is where colors gradually emerge from a single point and smoothly spread outward in a circular or elliptical shape while as we saw in linear gradient the colors were getting blended on a linear line so let's understand the syntax and use of radial gradients by practical implementation let's start by defining basic radial gradient i'll create an empty division and for the styling i'll give padding and margin to the div i'll define radial gradient function in background property so let me give background here and radial gradient function i'll define three colors with color stop points i'm giving 20% and 50% to the first two colors and you can see the elliptical gradient this is what the basic radial gradient looks like 
the first color which you define will start from the center of the element and fades towards the next color until it reaches the edge of the element. The fade happens at an equal rate no matter which direction. Right now as the element is not a square, an elliptical gradient is created. But with a square you can see a perfect circular gradient. So if I add equal width and height to the div along with some left margin to set it around the center, you can see now it shows the circular gradient. Depending on the shape, the radial gradient is created. But if you still wish to create a circular gradient, no matter the element's shape, you can add the circle keyword before the color. First, let me remove the width, height and left margin as well to bring the default shape back. You can see the ellipse in the output. Now I will give circle here and now you can see the ellipse is a circle irrespective of the element's shape. You can notice that the gradient fades all the way to the ending color. If we need this circle to be entirely within the element, we have to add a keyword closest side. Now this will give you a precise circular gradient as the fade ends when it reaches the closest side of the element. You can either give it to ellipse or circular. Just like the closest side, you can give closest corner, farthest side or farthest corner to any radial gradient. Now that you have an idea about how the circle and the ellipse look, let's get into positioning. By default, both ellipse and circle are centered horizontally and vertically in their container. In other words, at 50-50%. The important thing to notice here is that the positioning happens from the center of the circle or ellipse. So if we position it to top left, the center point will be positioned. So if I want to set the center point of the gradient to top left, I will write at top left. This is the syntax of giving position to any radial gradients. We specify the position by prefixing the positional value with at keyword. If you want circular gradient, you can add the circle keyword with the position value. And you can see how the gradient shape gets shifted. So this is how you can define a radial gradient for any element. Now let me give you an assignment. Using the radial gradient, create the following pattern using red, green and blue colors. We already have the div. Let's start applying the styles. I'll give padding 170 pixels, margin top 5em, margin left 5em, width and height the same as 50 pixels and border radius 50%. Next I'll give radial gradient inside the background property. I want to keep it circular so I will give circle keyword at 50% space 0. Instead of giving the positional keyword values, you can give the custom position by setting the horizontal position and vertical position. So here the first value that is 50% is horizontal position and 0 is the vertical position. I will separate it by comma and will define two colors, one with full opacity and other with zero opacity. So it will create a shade like gradient when I give a stopping position to this color. I'll keep it around 60%. Now you see that red gradient is displayed. We'll need two more gradients to create the pattern. So let me give comma here and define another radial gradient. I will keep the horizontal position to 5% and vertical to 75 giving two colors again. I'll keep the stop position same as above. Again giving comma, radial gradient, setting the horizontal position to 95% and vertical to 75, giving colors and here as well. I'll keep the stop position same that is 60%. Now the pattern looks very dark because it's just the gradients that have created this pattern. We haven't given any actual color to the background. So to make it bright, I will add a bright color to the background. Let me give white and we have created the pattern just like we wanted.
the conic gradient function creates a gradient that is rotated around the center of the element. It is similar to radial gradient and uses the center of the element as their source point. In conic gradient, the colors get spread equally around the center point as you can see. The color which is getting generated in radial gradient emerges from the center of the element while in conic gradient the color is placed around the element from the center. The gradient rotates from 0 degree to 360 degree by default. So let's check this gradient practically. I will define an empty div inside the body and will apply the gradient on this division. So let's move to the styling part. I will give margin 3 em, padding 10 em and border radius to 50%. Next I'll define the background property for giving the conic gradient function. I'll define two colors here and you can see the gradient. By default it will be at 0 degrees. They are named as conic gradient because they tend to look like a cone that is being viewed from the top. In conic gradients, the color transitions around the center of the element that is starting from a position and going clockwise around the center. While in radial gradient, the color transition is from the center and then it spreads outwards in all directions. Similar to radial gradients, the conic gradient syntax provides positioning the center that is the origin of the gradient anywhere within or even outside the element. By default, the position of the origin point is 50-50 in percentage. Let me change it to 40 and 30 percent. You can see now the center point has changed. You can also specify angle like here I give from 60 degrees. So you see that the origin is shifted and rotated to 60 degrees. If we do not specify an angle for the colors and color stop positions, then it is assumed that the gradient is evenly divided between the colors starting and ending at 0 degree or 360 degree. Now that creates a kind of hard stop where the colors bump right up to one another at 0 degree or 360 degree. We can set the starting color and ending color as the same to avoid the color bump. That creates a smoother gradient and we start to get that cool cone looking perspective. Let me also give color stop positions. I'll give 20, 60 and 100%. Now you see how the colors get transitioned. One more value you can specify for the color is the turn value. Turns are new in CSS3 and mean a rotation. One turn is equal to 360 degrees. Note that turn is singular and there is no space between the number and its unit. So for example, if I give 0.4 turn that is 144 degrees here, then the color transition will be completed. In the area which gets covered in a 0.4 turn, remaining area will be filled by the last color stop. So let me add color stops by adding turn values. You can see the color covers the area which gets included in one whole turn. If you set the value more than one turn then the color transition will spread up to the turns specified. But visually we can only see 360 degrees so we will not be able to see the colors that go beyond one complete turn. You can also give angle measurements like radian or gradient. If I give 2.5 radian here, a red or radian is equal to 180 by pi degrees or about 57.3 degrees. An angle of one radian on a circumference of a circle creates an arc with an equal length to the radius of the circle. Whereas the gradient is equivalent to 1 by 400 that is 0.0025 percent of a full circle. Similar to degrees a positive gradient value will go clockwise and a negative value goes counterclockwise and a hundred gradient will be at a 90 degree angle. So this is what the syntax of defining a conic gradient looks like. 
let's talk about a relative question that is explain a practical usage of conic gradient with css or this can be an assignment that apply gradient overlay on the image there are many practical uses of conic gradient function like you can apply conic gradient on the text or on the background or create an element using only conic gradient etc but most commonly they are used as an overlay on the images as to make them look aesthetically pleasing so in this assignment i'll be showing you how to give a gradient overlay on the image so i'll define a division with a class name overlay gradient as i'll be applying conic gradient on this division and inside i'll define an image tag giving the source in src giving an alternate name to the image you can see the image it's quite big right now let me set its width and height i'll give 550 pixels and height 300 to apply an overlay of gradient on the image the ideal way is to use after pseudo element as we already know that it creates a separate space for the content in which you can give special effects for that content so i will write dot overlay gradient and giving the after pseudo element here i'll keep the content blank setting the position to absolute keeping top and left to zero i also want to keep the width and height of the gradient as the image so i will give 550 pixels and height 300 now let's give the conic gradient and then we will try to adjust it on the image i'll give background property conic gradient and giving two colors to adjust the gradient on the image i'll just give margin property let me set it to 8 pixels all right so you can see the gradient is perfectly settled on the image now it's time to make it blend with the image so it will look more natural for that i'm using the property called mix blend mode this property will blend the gradient with the image there are various options available as you can see i'll choose overlay and you can see how beautiful and natural the gradient blends all right so the gradient is applied and you can clearly see the issue that is the vertical line we need to apply some values that will remove this line so if i keep the vertical position of the origin zero percent that will do the job let me set the position as 50 percent and zero percent and you can see our problem is solved if you want to see the before and after effect let me add a hover pseudo class here and now you can see when i hover the mouse cursor on the image it shows me the gradient effect so this is how you create an overlay gradient for an image and that's the practical use of this particular function so far we have seen that while applying font size or padding margin or maybe a dimension or angle we use some or the other unit with the value for example font size 12 px here px is the unit which stands for pixels another example is width is equal to 100 percent in this case percentage is the unit with the value like px or percentage we also have various other units for example you may apply width using px or even cm that is centimeters like width is equal to 34 pixels or maybe 3 cm working with units is an easy task but css offers various options of units which you can use as per requirement or for the best suitable situation css provides us with lots of units some of whose values are fixed generally known as absolute units while there are others whose values are relative to other values like a child elements value is dependent on the parent elements or to the default value of a particular html element these are called as relative units these two are major types of units in css as each of them provides a wide range of length values so let's dive into this section and take a closer look at various css units available the px unit is the magic unit of css it basically stands for pixels this unit is mainly designed for css and is the most 
widely used absolute length unit. Pixel is a fixed unit measurement as it is an absolute length value and is also the smallest unit on screen measurement. So let's directly see some practical implementation using the unit pixel. I'll start by creating a division and I'll pass a message inside. Now to style this div, I'll start with background color. We'll give text color. Let's also center align this text by giving text align. I will also increase the font size to 50 pixels. And you can see the area of the division also increased in the context with the font size. Generally, one pixel equals the 96th part of one inch, that is 1 by 96 inch. So, 50 pixels will be 50 multiplied with 1 by 96 inches. This is how the pixels are calculated. Let me also give some padding. I'll say about 110 pixels and margin about 30 pixels. 50 pixels and you can see the result. Let's add a few more properties. I'll give width 200 pixels, height 150 pixels and border radius 50 pixels. And this is how the pixel unit works. The question is what is one pixel equals to in inches? So one pixel equals the 96th part of one inch. The PT that is point unit of measurement came from the typography industry and that's why in most cases it is used for declaring font sizes. A point is a unit of measurement used for real life ink on paper typography. 72 points make 1 inch. Here the 1 inch we are talking about is referred to with the one real life inch like on a ruler not an inch on a screen which is totally arbitrary based on the resolution for the best cross browser and cross platform results for printing the content on pages defining the point unit can be considered as a better option considering the accuracy with pixels Point sizes are more accurate on paper rather than displaying the content on the screen. So let's implement this unit practically. I'll define two paragraphs inside the body having the class names as pixel unit and point unit respectively. Now let me apply font size and color to the first paragraph. I'll give 30 pixels to font size. And for the second paragraph, I am giving the font size in points, I'll say 30 points. So you can easily compare the size difference of points and pixels. Of course, the pixel is the smallest unit, so it will be comparatively smaller than the point. The same difference can be observed when giving different properties to the elements like padding or margin. Let me add a border to both the classes so that it will become easy to compare. Let's say if I give 40 pixels padding to the first paragraph and 40 point padding to the second, you can see that the point unit leaves more padding space. Now let's talk about relative questions. So what is a point size unit in CSS? So the point unit is basically used for defining the font size Points are the unit of measurements which are used when the content is to be printed on the paper. Points are based on an inch on a ruler and one inch is equal to 72 points. The centimeter unit is used to define a length value to the properties which deal with shapes and sizes or spacing of the elements. Let's check it practically. We'll compare centimeter unit with pixels. So I will create two paragraphs inside the body. One will have the class name centimeter and the other as pixel. Now for the styling, let's set the font size of the first paragraph to centimeters. 
I'll give the font size property to 1.5 cm and you can see the change in the size. Similarly, if I give the same font size value but in pixels, you can see the pixel value is hardly visible. As the centimeter unit also maps to the pixels unit, the value of 1 centimeter is equal to 37.8 pixels. So if I want to match this font size, that is the 1.5 centimeter to its corresponding pixel length, I would have to set it to 56.7 pixels, which equals 1.5 centimeter eventually. And you can see the font size of these paragraphs matches. Giving centimeter units might create a difference in output viewed from various devices. So generally when you are building a web page which is specifically to be viewed from the computer screen, better not overuse the centimeter unit as the output may occur differently when viewed from other small screen devices. So let's discuss a question here. What is one centimeter equals to in pixels? So as we saw earlier, one centimeter equals 37.8 pixels. The mm or millimeter unit in CSS is a magnitude lower than the centimeter unit. One mm equals one tenth of a centimeter and that equals 3.78 pixels. The use of the mm unit is similar to the centimeter unit. It is particularly used when the content is to be displayed on any printing media platform as the length size expressed with this unit is very precise and accurate. So in the front end community, the mm unit is not recommended to be used for displaying contents on screen as the screen sizes may vary which results in the content not getting displayed properly. Let's check an example. I'm going to create three paragraphs inside body with class name as millimeter, pixel and centimeter. Now for the first paragraph, I'll give font size, let's say 7 mm. As the millimeter is one tenth of the centimeter, the corresponding centimeter value of 7 mm will be 0.7 cm. So I will give the font size as 0.7 cm. And to match this font size in pixels, the pixel value will be around 26.46 px as 1 mm equals 3.78 pixel. So let me give here 26.46 pixel. And you can see the result. Now let's talk about a practice assignment. Implement the CSS code to display the shown result. Looking at the result, you can identify that all these are just simple borders with different colors. So let me create a paragraph with some text and let's implement the style of it. Set the font size to 7 mm. Next, I will define the border top property to define the top border. I'll give the width in mm and color. Similarly, I will define three more borders that is bottom, left and right with the same width and different colors. All right, we are very near to our goal. Let me keep the alignment of the text to center and we'll set some padding to create a little gap between the borders and the text. And at last, giving some margin from top, just so to make it set around the vertical center. And we have achieved our result. The inch unit in CSS is another useful unit. When you want to display the content on the page, that is for printing the output on a paper. Inches are not widely used for displaying on screen outputs as the result is not always accurate. The accuracy always depends on the screen of a particular device. And as we know, the device may vary, thus it may alter the final result in some cases. In CSS, one inch equals 96 pixels which is about 2.54 centimeters. So let's take a look at an example. I will create two paragraphs. First paragraph, I'll give class name as inch and second paragraph, I'll name it as pixel. Now inside the style, giving the font size, 
of about 0.5 inch to the first paragraph. If I give 1 inch, you can see how big the font gets as 1 inch is equivalent to 96 pixels. So I will drop the size to 0.5 inch. Next, I will give the pixel value and the pixel value for 0.5 inch would be 48 pixels. As 1 inch equals 96, 0.1 inch would be 9.6 pixels and so the 0.5 inch or half of an inch would be 48 pixels. It's just some simple calculations and as a front-end developer, it is very essential that you do some calculations before giving the values to any element. The PICA unit is yet another typographic unit of measurement used for printing the content on a paper and is approximately one-sixth of an inch. Picas are equivalent to 16 pixels and if compared with points, one pica is equal to 12 points that is 6 picas per inch. So let's get on with the practical implementation of this unit. I am going to create three paragraphs. We'll compare the pica, pixel and point units. I'll give the class names accordingly. Now inside style, I'll give two picas as font size to the first paragraph and to define the pica unit, the P and C initials are used. And for the second paragraph, as to match the size of the first paragraph, the font size will be 32 pixels as one pica equals 16 pixels. So two pica would be 32 pixels. Same thing would be applied for giving the size in the point unit as 1 pica equals 12 points. So to reach the size of 2 picas, the point size will be 24 points. So this was about the pica unit and the end of the absolute units section. Once again to summarize, absolute units are the fixed units. Lastly, I have created a simple chart of absolute units for you to remember them easily. When it comes to designing responsive sites, relative unit such as M is a must have unit as it gives adaptability and flexibility in sizes defined for fonts and elements. M which is a short form for ephemeral unit is a widely used relative length unit as it can be used in any situation like setting up the font size or setting the length of any element like width, padding, margin, height, etc. It's very straightforward and simple to use. So let's have a look at an example. I will create a division and will define a paragraph inside. Inside styling, I'll simply give font size to the paragraph. Let's say 1.5 m's. Let me add a border as well. We will require a border here to understand an example as we move ahead. All right, so you can see the increase in the font size. By default, the size of font is 1M, which is 100%. When given an M unit as font size, the size of an element will always relate to the size given inside the parent element. In a shorter version, the M's unit is always relative to their parent. Like here, if I give font size to this div, let's say about 1.2 M, then you can see the overall font size of the paragraph is increased. So it's going to multiply the sizes of parent element and child element, that is 1.2 M into 1.5 M in this case. And the final result will be applied to the child element that is in our case the paragraph. Let's see how padding is calculated when we assign M unit to it. First, let me justify the text so that we can see the padding properly. Now let me give padding here, I'll say 2.5 M. Now let me open developers tool. I'll click on computed and I'll select the paragraph. And you can see the padding of the paragraph is 72 pixels. How? The overall font size of the paragraph is 1.2 M into 1.5 M that is 1.8 M. 
Finally, the padding of each side of the paragraph is 1.8 m's into 2.5 m's, which is 4.5 m's, which equals 72 pixels as 1 m equals 16 pixels. Let's take one more example. I will change the font size of the div to 20 pixels, font size of paragraph to 1.25 m and padding to 2 m's. Now the padding is calculated like this. The overall font size of the paragraph is now 25 pixels. So padding will be 25 pixels into 2 m's that is 50 pixels. So this is how the m unit works. There is also one more concept. Well actually it's more of an issue where the m unit compounds from one level to another. I will show you what I mean. Let me remove this paragraph and I'll name this div as parent. Also, I will give a message. This is a parent division. Similarly, I'll have two more divisions as a child of the parent div. Now in the styling, let me give the class selector names and I will change the font size of parent div and child div to 20 pixels and 2 m's. If you observe the output, you can see the problem I was discussing. This issue is called the compounding effect, where the unit keeps on multiplying when there are multiple M font size elements within one another. This can become a problem and can lead to unintended consequences in your designs. This is where the REM unit comes in handy and that we will learn in the next lecture. Continuing with this example. Now let's talk about relative questions. So what is 1m equals to in pixels? Generally 1m always equals 16 pixels. But pixel is a static unit whereas m is a relative unit. Which means the size of the m depends on the parent element as well. The second question is what is m relative to or why m is a relative unit? Well, the M is considered as a relative unit because the font size is relative to its parent element's font size. So if you wish to scale the element's size based on its parent size, you use the M unit as it is also responsive in web designing. The third question is, apart from font size property, can the M unit relate with other properties of the parent element? The answer is no. When you declare an M length unit on padding, margin, width or any other properties apart from the font size on the parent element, it does not affect the width, padding or margin of the child element. There is also one more question that what is the compounding effect issue when you are dealing with M unit? And we have already discussed in this case it was compounding. The solution to that we are going to see in the next lecture. The rem is a relative unit which is always based upon the font size value of the root element and the root element in HTML is the HTML element itself. That's why rem that is short for root m. If the HTML element doesn't have any font size specified then the browser will take the default font size that is 16 pixels. So what this means is that by using the rem unit, the values of the parent elements are ignored and only the value of the root is taken into consideration. Let me continue with the previous lectures example. The issue we were facing was the compounding effect where the unit keeps on compounding when there are multiple M font size elements within one another. Alright, to fix this I'll use the rem unit instead of M and you can see just when I changed the unit to rem all the child divisions share the same font size that is 32 pixels. Why is it so? Because now the font size is not relative to the parent element instead it is relative to the root element which is the HTML element. 
and as the default size of the root element is 16 pixels, the division's font size got multiplied with 16 pixels, that is 16 pixels into 2 rem. If you want to change the font size of the root element, you can do that by giving the font size property to the HTML element. I'll say HTML here and we'll give font size to 12 pixels. Now the font size of all the child divisions is 24 pixels. And to check that, let me open the developer's tool inside the browser. First, let me show you the font size of the root element. I will select the HTML tag and then I'll click this computed option. And when I scroll down, you can see the font size that is 12 pixels. I will select the child division next and you can see it shows the font size 24 pixels. Now, which unit to use generally depends on your personal preference. There is no better unit really. Some people like to design everything in RAM units for consistency and predictability, while others like to use M units in places where the influence of nearby parent elements would make sense. REMs aren't only useful for font sizing. You can use the REMs as a base for creating an entire grid system or any UI library on the root HTML font sizing using REM. This can give you better and predictable font sizing and scaling. I would like to add a bonus tip here. There are some browsers which still do not support the REM unit. And to avoid this kind of compatibility issue, we specify the fallback by defining the pixel font size first and then the RAM font size. You can see as our browser is compatible, it relates to RAM font size. But if any browser is not compatible with RAM, it's going to take the pixel value. So let's talk about the questions. What is a RAM unit? So the rem is a relative unit which is relative to the root element that is the HTML, not to its parent element. The next question is how many pixels are there in one rem? If there is no size defined inside the root element that is the HTML element, the rem is going to take 16 pixels by default. So one rem equals 16 pixels. The next question is, explain the compatibility issue faced while using the REM unit and how can you resolve it? So I have just discussed in the bonus tip that certain browsers still face the compatibility issue with the REM unit. So to avoid that situation, we define the font size in pixel value first as a fallback and then again define the font size in REM. So when the browser fails to recognize the REM unit, it will consider the pixel value. The font size defined in percentage is relative to its parent element's size and a parent element size can be either absolute or relative that doesn't matter. 100% equals 16 pixels. Let's check few examples. I'm going to create a division as a container and inside I will define a paragraph. Now let me define a border for this division inside style so we can have a clear idea about the area getting covered by the division. Next I will define the font size of the paragraph say about 250%. Now I will give font size to the division I will say 120% and you can see the increase in size as the paragraph is now relative to the font size of the division which is its parent. Let's make the font size to 150% and the font size of the paragraph increases again. Let's give a different property, say width, but first let me give a border to the paragraph so that you can see the changing of the width. Now I will give width to the paragraph and to this div as well. I will say 350 pixels for div and 80% width for the paragraph. Now what's going on here is the width of the parent element that is div is getting multiplied with the width of paragraph. 
that is 350 pixels into 0.8 and the overall width is applied to the paragraph. Let's add few more properties. I'll apply margin to div, top and bottom margin. I'll keep 30% and right and left margin to 25%. Lastly, I'll add padding to the paragraph, say about 5%. Percentage unit in CSS is very handy when it comes to positioning the elements on the page. Most often they are used in creating fluid layouts. What are fluid layouts, you may ask? A fluid layout is a type of a web page design in which layout of the page resizes as the window size is changed. Most of the page components in a fluid page layout adjust to the user's screen size by using percentage widths rather than fixed pixel widths. Let me create another simple example. I'll define two divisions. One we will keep it fixed by using pixel values and for another we are going to make it a part of fluid layout. Now for fixed layout I'll define border width about 400 pixels and padding of 50 pixels. Similarly, for fluid layout, I will define the same properties but in percentage units. Now watch this. When I resize the browser, you can see that the fixed division is not adjusting to the browser's screen, while the second division is adjusting as per the browser's screen. This is what creating a fluid layout looks like. You can also give the percentages to create flexible images. By doing so, the image will also adjust with the browser screen. So this is what working with percentage looks like. There are some properties which do not accept the percentage unit. For example, border width. Let me apply border width to the division. I'll remove this pixel width from the border. And I'll give percentage width about let's say 12%. You can see there is no change in the width of the border. Now if I change the unit to pixels, the given width is getting applied as you can see. Remember the percentage unit shows the relevancy with the parent element. The X unit is defined as the X height of the current font or half of 1M. 1X height equals 6 pixels. The X height of a given font is the height of the lowercase x of that font. As you can see in this figure, the X height is the height of a normal lowercase letter in a line of text. Generally, this is the height of lowercase letters, but there will be cases where certain letters exceed the X height, but that depends on the font family as well. In the typographic dimension of design, the height of letters has important spatial relationships to the rest of the elements. The lines shown in the figure are intended to help for pointing out the X height of the text. The X unit is similar to the M or REM as it also relies on the current font and its size. However, unlike the M and REM, this unit also relies on the font family as they are highly based on font specific measures. Let's check an example real quick. Let me define two paragraphs with class names X height and pixel. I will give the font size to the first paragraph as 9x. Now, as 1x equals 6 pixels, the related pixel value for 9x will be 54 pixels. So I will give 54 pixels here as font size of the second paragraph. You can see some difference in the output. Why? Because as I have mentioned that the x value is created using the font specific measures. That means the x unit is highly dependent on the font family. Now when no font family is specified, the HTML page will load in its default font family, that is Times New Roman. And the X unit renders 
these fonts in different size ratio compared to the pixels. This is why the X units are rarely used in front end development. I have covered this topic because it's very essential that you should know this kind of unit as well and have some idea about working with them. The CH unit which stands for character unit is a unit that lets you limit the width of text elements by character count more specifically. It is defined as being the advanced measure of the width of the zero character for a given font. Let me show you what this means. I will create a simple input inside the body. I am going to style this input by giving border radius to 0.6 rem, font size 2m, margin 2 rem and padding 0.4 rem. Now when I give the width 10 ch, the input will adjust in a way that only the first 10 characters are going to be displayed on the screen and the unit ch sets the width of characters considering the space taken by the character 0. Let me give proper digits. I'll give 1 to 10 digits and when I add the 11th digit then the first digit gets hidden. So again only 10 characters are seen here. Let's try alphabetical letters. I'll change the width to 15 characters and giving the alphabetical letters until I fill up the given width. Alright, so now what do you see? If you count the letters, they are exceeding the range of 15 characters. Why is it so? Because the CH unit takes the character 0 for setting up the width. So let me give zeros instead of these letters. And now you can see 15 character sets the width which takes up to 15 zeros. You can also set the width of a paragraph. Let me define a paragraph and give font size. We'll set the width to 50 characters. By doing this, the line will never be longer than the equivalent length of 50 zero characters for this font in this font size. This lets you customize the user interface with limited characters. As a developer, it is a good practice that you declare a parent container with some desired width and then you can assign width in character to the inner text elements. By doing this, it will be easy for you to customize and manage the code. You can also define the character unit with different properties as well. It's just that there is no constant pixel or any other value which relates to ch that is character as the character is a relative unit and it equals the width of the zero glyph in whichever font you are using. The VW unit that is the viewport width works just like the percentage unit. Viewport units have been around for quite a few years now since it was first introduced in CSS. They are considered as truly responsive length units because every time when the browser is resized, their value changes accordingly. Let's first understand what a viewport is. The viewport is defined as the user's visible area of a web page. The viewport varies with the device and will be smaller on a mobile screen than on a computer screen. Basically, viewports are used to customize the layout in a way that it fits well on the screen. There are four viewport based units in CSS, VW, VH, Vmin and Vmax. In this lecture, we will understand the viewport width that is VW. The viewport width unit is based on the width of the viewport and the value of one viewport width equals 1% of the viewport width. So the 20 VW will be equivalent to occupying 20% of the entire visible screen width. Let's see this practically. I will define an empty division and will give background and height inside style. Now if I give here 30 viewport width, you can see it occupies 30% of the browser's width. If I change it to 60 
view port width then it's going to occupy 60 percent of the browser's width in many cases viewports may work similar to percentages but they are still very different from one another let's check another example where i create a parent child div for applying percentage values and viewport width values i'm going to define a parent div let me name it as parent percentage div and a child div i'll name it as child percentage div similarly i will create another parent child div naming it as parent viewport div and child viewport div now let's style the parent percentage div i'll apply background height width i'll keep 50 percent top and bottom padding and margin at the last for the child percentage div i'll give background height and width 80 percent here the width of the child div is relative to the parent div that is the width of the parent division is 50 percent and the child division is 80 percent of that 50 percent as you can see moving on i'll keep the styling of the parent viewport div and child viewport div the same as mentioned above the only change will be in the width of the child viewport div i am going to give 80 viewport width to it and now what do you see the child division is wider than its parent division you may raise a question why is it so isn't 80 percent the same as 80 viewport width well this is what the viewport width does it removes the dependency of any parent element and allows sizing based on the viewport size of the browser window in simple words a percentage length is relative to containing element width while a viewport width is relative to the full width of the browser window the viewport height that is the vh unit is based on the height of the viewport it works just like the percentage unit as well the value of one viewport height equals one percent of viewport height so specifying 20 vh for example will be equivalent to occupying the 20 percent of the visible screen height assume that we have a viewport whose overall height is 300 pixels so when the height of 40 vh is applied on the viewport then it will be calculated like this though viewport works just like a percentage unit setting up the height in viewport and percentage is still very different to understand that let's implement an example i will create two headings inside the body giving heading one as viewport height and second heading as percentage height now let's style them for h1 i will first apply the display property and will set it to inline block as i want these two headings on the same level then i will apply font size border width 42 vw and height let's say 70 vh let me give some margin as well now there is a simple trick to calculate an accurate margin which relates to the viewport of the window and that is you subtract the given height from 100 and further divide that value by 2 in our case the height is 70 vh so the margin value will be 15 vh now let's style the h2 as well I will duplicate the h1 styling and rename it as h2 i will just change the height to 70 percent and keep others the same and you can see both headings are displayed but did you notice that the height of the second heading is not getting applied the reason is the percentage value is relative to its parent element so we have to give height to the parent element as well and here the parent element is the body tag so let me give height to the body i will say 100 percent and still you can see the height is not getting applied 
because the body also has a parent element and that is the HTML tag itself. So I will add HTML tag with height property as well. Now you can see that the height is getting applied on the heading. So when you give the percentage value, you will have to keep in mind that it relates to the parent element as well. While with the viewports, the height and width relies on the overall screen size only. So this is what working with viewport height looks like. While VH and VW are always related to the viewport height and width respectively, Vmin and Vmax are related to the maximum or minimum of those widths and heights depending on which is smaller and larger. Vmin represents the value of the minimum width and height of the viewport while Vmax which is exactly the opposite of Vmin it calculates the value based on the maximum height and width of the viewport. In Vmin, if the viewport height that is the browser's height is smaller than its width, the value of one Vmin will be equal to 1% of the viewport height. Similarly, if the viewport width is smaller than the height, the value of one Vmin will be equal to 1% of the viewport width. In Vmax, if the viewport height is larger than the width, the value of 1 Vmax will be equal to 1% of viewport height. Similarly, if the viewport width is larger than the height, the value of 1 Vmax will be equal to 1% of the viewport width. Consider this example where we have this screen in landscape mode having the width of 1920 pixels and has the height of 1080 pixels. As the width of the viewport is greater than its height, 1 Vmin will be 10.8 pixels and 1 Vmax will be 19.2 pixels. Similarly, 10 Vmin will be 108 pixels and 10 Vmax will be 192 pixels. Now if the screen is rotated, the viewport becomes 1920 pixels high and 1080 pixels wide. Then 10 Vmax will be 192 pixels because now the value is calculated based on the viewport height and 10 Vmin will be 108 pixels. Just to clarify that, 1 Vmax equals 1 Vh in portrait mode and in landscape mode 1 Vmax equals 1 Vw. Now if the screen is resized and the width of the viewport becomes 900 pixels wide and 1600 pixels high, then the value of 1 Vmin and Vmax will be 9 pixels and 16 pixels. Similarly, the value of 10 Vmin and Vmax will be 90 pixels and 160 pixels. The value of Vmin and Vmax change whenever the browser window is resized. This is how the Vmax and Vmin units function. Let's check an example. I will define heading and a paragraph. And now let's style them. For heading, I am giving font size of 10 Vmin. It will consider the viewport of the browser window since I am not specifying any height and width to the document. Next, I will just align the heading to center. For the paragraph, I am giving font size 3 Vmax and width about 90%. Alright, now when I resize the window, you can see the font size is getting adjusted continuously as the viewport keeps on changing. If I change the unit to let's say rem and m, now if I resize you can see it is not getting adjusted as the rem and m are not related to the viewport. So this is what using viewport unit looks like. Let's talk about a question. So explain what Vmin and Vmax is. Well, they are units. Vmin represents the value of minimum width and height of the viewport, while 
Vmax, which is exactly the opposite of Vmin, it calculates the value based on the maximum height and width of the viewport. Next question, what will be the value of Vmax and Vmin if the height of the viewport is larger than its width? So if the viewport's height is larger than its width, then the value of 1 Vmax is equivalent to 1% of viewport's height and the value of 1 Vmin is equivalent to 1% of the viewport's width. In CSS, you may come across situations where you have to set an angle measurement for particular elements. CSS provides us with four different angle measurement values expressed in degrees, radians, gradients and turns. Degrees range is from 0 degree to 360 and you can define it either in positive or negative. Negative degrees go counterclockwise, that is, it will turn to its left side, whereas positive degrees go clockwise, which is to its right. The rad or radian represents an angle. One radian is equivalent to 180 by pi degrees or about 57.3 degrees. A radian creates an angle on the circumference of a circle in an arc shape which is of equal length to the radius of the circle. One full circle is of 2 pi radians, half a circle is pi radian and half a circle in counterclockwise direction is minus pi radian. Next we have gradients that is grad which is equivalent to 1 by 400 of the full circle. Similar to degrees, a positive grad value will go clockwise, a negative value goes counterclockwise, a 100 grad will be at 90 degree angle. Minus 200 grad will be at 180 degrees and so on. Finally, the turns unit. This unit is a newer concept which is introduced in CSS3 and it means rotation. One turn is equal to 360 degrees, two turns is 720 degrees and so on. Turn is a singular and there is no space between the number and its unit. As the browsers got updated and started showing compatibility with animations and transitions of shapes or elements, the angle measurement units were introduced and now they are equally important as length units. These units are majorly used with the properties like animation, transform or gradient properties such as radial gradient method, linear gradient, conical gradient, also used with functions like skew, translate, rotate, scale, etc. All these are advanced concepts which I will cover as we move along. So this was about the angle measurement units in CSS. Time measurement units are very easy to understand and implement. CSS provides two time measurement units, seconds that is S and milliseconds that is MS. These two units are used with the properties that require to specify the duration of something like animation or transition. There are 1000 milliseconds in a second. The format of a time value is a number followed by S for seconds and MS for milliseconds. So let's have a look at an example. I'm going to create a division inside the body and apply styles to it, giving background color, height, width and border radius. You can see a circular shape in the output. Now I will create a hover effect on it. I will give the hover pseudo class here, adding a different color along with a transition of 0.8 seconds. Now when I hover on this division, you can see the color is getting changed, but with a transition of 0.8 seconds. So this is where the time units are used. I can also change this time unit in milliseconds. Let me give 800 milliseconds and you can see the transition effect. The use of seconds or milliseconds is totally up to you. 
there is no comparison of which unit is better. These units are majorly used with transition property and with the animation property. So this is how the time measurement units come in handy. Remember that you cannot give negative time values, they must always be positive.